group of us. I can do that. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, the first item of business on our agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have um, two updates for the board and for the public. Um, first, I wanted to report back that yesterday the board held our data governance council meeting. This is a revamp of the data governance council that the board put in place in 2014. And um, the meeting uh, went very well. Um, you had approved the charter of the Data Governance Council a couple of months ago. Um, so we're off and running. Um, we will conduct meetings pretty much bi-monthly, but if we have a need to schedule a meeting, we can do that ad hoc. And um, Tom Pelham is one of the council members, so thank you, Tom, for participating and if you have anything to add you, you can just thank Kevin for having me participate. <laughs> thank you Kevin um, and then the other announcement uh, for the board and for the public is that um, the primary care advisory group will be sunsetting in uh, July 1st um, this was a statutorily prescribed group that was looking at administrative burden for primary care providers. Um, we have decided to continue the primary care advisory group as a technical advisory group to the board, and um, applications are now being accepted. We have contacted um, the DMS, by state VAS, other groups to solicit applications. Uh, those are, the, the application is essentially uh, why a, a provider would want to be on the primary care advisory group and their CV, and those are due to the chair by July 15th. We will have a posting on our website as well. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. And uh, the initial response to people showing interest in the uh, PCAG has been uh, quite uh, robust, so it looks like we'll have uh, plenty of candidates to uh, try to uh, choose from. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the minutes of Wednesday, May 30th. Is there a motion? I'm the fifth. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 30th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Actually, I, I, I think there is a correction, which is I was, I'm listed as in attendance, and I was not in attendance. That's pretty amazing, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> And so the vote, likewise, as Maureen just pointed out to me, should be 4-0. Yes, I'll abstain. Okay. So it's been moved um, to approve the minutes of Wednesday, May 30th, with the corrections of removing Robin as an attendee and changing the vote total to 4 to nothing. Is there any other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And now I'll we abstain. I abstain. Let the let the record show that it was a four zero vote. And now we can get to the business at hand. And um, it seems like an overwhelming number of people, <laughs> but in reality, we're actually taking a lot of flack um, for not having more people on the panel. If you could imagine this. Um, but this is, this is an ongoing discussion, and it shows the importance of this topic um, to this board and also to Vermonters. And um, just as a way of announcement, on tentatively on August 9th at Castleton University, there will be a workforce summit um, that the Nurses Union is coordinating with the faculty down there and others. And um, so this is not a, a one day on and, and then we're done with this discussion. This is a continual discussion that we continue to have. 
our statutory um, work on workforce stems from um, 18 VSA Chapter 220 that talks about um, the board having to approve um, the health care uh, workforce plan. Um, we have the author of the last uh, workforce plan as a member of the board now, Robin Lunge. And of course, she'll quickly say that it was a whole team of people. Um, but it is the, in statute, it is the, um, help me with the correct title. Director of Healthcare Reform. The Director of Healthcare's Reform's responsibility to um, put out the, the workforce strategic plan and also to um, work with the working group that's still in place um, to have modifications. And we haven't had any modifications since 2013, so it has been five years, and maybe it's time that um, we take a, some look at that. But this, this today is meant more of having the discussion, trying to bring people from different areas of healthcare together to talk about what we continually hear about as we're out in the field. Uh, it doesn't matter which hospital that, that we're visiting or which budget we're overlooking. Um, we hear um, about shortages in the workforce, and it changes from geographic regions of the state. Some regions are truly struggling in the um, specialties. Other regions are struggling with primary care. We have a common theme throughout the state of a shortage of nursing. And we know that whenever a traveler is hired, that um, the expenses to the budgets are much higher than if they had a legitimate um, actual member of their workforce. So everyone wants to hire Vermonters. These are good paying jobs with benefits. And um, so I know that we're not gonna solve the, the problem today, but I think if we can help to have this free flow of ideas between all of you on the panel, um, we can start to get there. And um, it may require some steps that end up in failure. I, I'll point to what happened at the College of St. Joseph. Everybody knows that we need more primary care providers, and yet one of the reasons why the, the college almost closed is they spent half of their endowment on trying to start a PA program and could not get it off the ground. So um, there may be mistakes that are made along the way, but that doesn't mean we should stop trying to um, improve the workforce, especially when you're at a hospital and the people that are around you are, are older than you and um, they're saying that they're the average age that they see at their, their workplace. And I know at least personally, I'm starting to look as I'm getting older to try to find, um, my doctor retires next year, I'm trying to find somebody that's a lot younger than me. And um, I think that uh, it would, in, it would uh, really uh, give the existing providers uh, a ray of hope if they saw that um, there were efforts put into making sure that somebody can actually replace them so that they actually might be able to retire without having the burden of guilt of leaving their community behind. And so I'm going to ask um, each of the um, members of the panel to briefly, and I'll say in two minutes or less, introduce yourself and what your role is. And then we're going to come back to you and. Um, just ask you to start to um, frame it through your lens of what you're seeing as far as workforce shortage, what you see as possible solutions, what you see as um, possible barriers to solutions, and so on and so forth. So I guess um, we'll start and go from right to left. Okay, well, uh, thank you all. I really appreciate uh, you all having so many of us here and uh, uh, working towards addressing some of these issues. Uh, my name is Sean Tester. I am the uh, CEO of Northern Lieutenant's Healthcare. Uh, we're the uh, FQHC serving all of uh, Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, as well as Catalonia Home Health and Hospice. 
Um, so I uh, want to start by sharing, Tom just mentioned to me, uh, last time I had the pleasure of presenting to you all in February in St. Johnbury, um, I opened with a little anecdote. So I'm going to open with another one um, that kind of highlights kind of the challenges around out-migration and finding that special kind of person who's willing to live in the long, cold winters of the first kingdom. Uh, there was an, there's an island in the Connecticut River um, at the mouth of the Pasumpta uh, uh, River. And uh, an old Vermonter is with the immigration. And uh, a couple years, well, going back a ways now, um, it was resurveyed. And uh, it was discovered that that island is, in fact, in New Hampshire. And when they let the Vermonter know that he was, in fact, a New Hampshire resident, he said, thank God, I couldn't stand another Vermont winter. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we, uh, I wanted to open my conversation talking about demographic change. And I think you, you all may have seen these slides. Uh, the first couple slides I stole from uh, John Freeman of NCIC, uh, who stole the data, I believe, from Mark Wolf. But it really talks to uh, the, what I call the demographic challenges that we have in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, you know, if you look at this first slide, so you see this total workforce of 125,000. We don't have that size workforce in the Northeast Kingdom. This is data for the Northeast Kingdom and Northern New Hampshire, so co-ops and Grafton counties, which we also pull, draw from as a potential labor pool for our communities. Um, if you go back to 2010, the total workforce for Northern New Hampshire and the Northeast Kingdom was about 125,000 people. Fast forward to today, as our population's age, we're down to around 111,000. That's a drop of about 13,000 people out of the labor force. And as you look at the cohort of people in the younger generations coming up, those cohorts are simply smaller. Um, the final slide that I want to leave you with around the demographic numbers is the projection for the average age of uh, Vermonters across the entire state. We're all seeing this. Okay. If you look uh, today, and I leave the slide down there, we're at about 15% uh, in 2010, being uh, 65 or older. 2020 is projected to be uh, over 20% and just worse. Now, um, what I like to say uh, of us in the Northeast Kingdom is we are on the bleeding edge of that curve. So the communities we're taking care of, our patients, are the oldest, sickest, poorest Vermonters. So we're already feeling the impact of this demographic shift within our population. Now, that has another uh, challenge. So one is who's going to do the work, right? Where is our workforce coming from? But the other problem is that those, those cohorts of aging Vermonters, the people that are aging in place, what happens when we get older? We need more health care, right? So the demand on services for the organizations that are struggling to find the workforce um, is just growing. And, and, and that is contributing to a whole host of problems. So when you look at our system, to what we need today in our system, and I think this is, I, I'm speaking you know, about my experience in Northern counties, but this is really universal for the most system, probably the rest of the state. But, um, the types of uh, healthcare workers we need, we need primary care physicians, okay? We, um, the average age of my primary care physicians is over 55, and we struggle to find people to bring to the area who, uh, who, who want to practice primary care. Um, physical therapists, we really struggle with physical therapists in home health. Right? So what's happened is our population is aging, people are getting a lot more ortho care, they want to age in place in the home. Physical therapy is an important component of helping people successfully navigate that. And uh, last year, we had to rely on travelers to uh, meet that demand. Um, mental health professionals, uh, we, we talked about that a lot. Uh, you know, the state of crisis, you know, uh, across the board, uh, huge need there. Um, but I, also, I really want to speak specifically to uh, nursing nursing professionals. Um, you know, I brought, uh, this is the ad running in the Caledonia record right now for Caledonia Home Health and Hospice in the positions we're seeking right now today. Uh, physical therapists, uh, uh, we're looking for a high-tech pediatric home care nurse, we're looking for a couple community health staff nurses as well as maternal child health staff nurses. 
Um, those are just the needs within my organization in Park Health. We are also looking for nursing staff for primary care, and I know for a fact that um, NVRH is looking for staff as well. Um, dentists, um, you know, if you look, uh, the, I think the standard of care is you should have about 1,200 to 1,500 patients per dentist in the area. I think areas like Chittenden County need that. In the Northeast Kingdom, we have something like 3,400 to 3,600 patients per dentist. There aren't enough dentists to take care for our population of this Kingdom. And again, we have the challenge around the aging workforce. Many of the dentists in our area are older. Um, they're looking at retirement. Um, many are hanging on because there isn't someone to replace them. Uh, but that's a huge challenge. Um, the other thing, you know, we talk about healthcare and the healthcare workforce, but for us, uh, we also are strained to find uh, other professionals to support the systems, whether that's information systems professionals to support our EMRs and our networks and our communication systems, but also um, our managers and administrators to help support um, the complex healthcare system so that our providers can do their work. Um, you know, I think, especially in the Northeast Kingdom, there are significant headwinds that make the workforce challenge uh, even more challenging, even within Vermont. Um, the first one of those, um, I, I kind of label just culture and community. Now, people like me, I was born and raised, well, I was raised in the Northeast Kingdom, I was born I love the Northeast Kingdom, but it takes a special kind of person to live there. Um, you know, you don't have access to the same types of cultural opportunities you have in a more urban area. And uh, that makes it hard to recruit people from out of the area back to, uh, into the Northeast Kingdom. Um, another big problem is housing stock. Um, I think in the Northeast Kingdom, what we see is there's a lot of housing that's, that's under $200,000 but it tends to be housing that's in decline and in need of serious work. And then there's a lot of really expensive housing, kind of houses over $400,000. And uh, the type of feedback, uh, last winter I was trying to recruit a dentist to my area and spent a lot of time trying to recruit this dentist. And he spent time with his wife looking at housing in the area and he came back saying, where do people live? I, I mean, we were paying a decent salary. He's like, I can't afford a nice house here. So that's a, that's a huge problem. Um, the other issue, which is getting a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, press right now, but the, the challenge around the trailing spouse. And, and how do you, you may find a great healthcare professional, but you also need to find um, work employment, meaningful employment with their spouse or partner. Um, huge challenge for us uh, in the middle of this um, another problem that we face as an organization is uh, wage inflation as compared to reimbursement rate inflation. So, you know, home health and hospice, we really rely on, on a talented, just dedicated nursing staff to provide quality care. But if you look in our area, this is a rough guess, but I would say that um, wage inflation for nursing professionals is running at about a 5% increase annually. Um, but we struggle to get reimbursement to come anywhere near that. So uh, in, in over years, that, that goes like this, and then we can no longer afford to pay for salary. Um, and then finally, um, I can't stress this enough, uh, but it's provider burnout. So, um, so we've talked a lot about uh, burnout with primary care uh, physicians and the administrative burden that they have that, that, um, that makes it hard for them to, to do their job and to feel like they're doing meaningful work. Uh, but um, what we're really starting to see is burnout across the system. You know, and again, home health and hospice, where we really had to rely on travelers last year. You know, we struggle to find staff, we, we, we ask people to do more, we stretch everybody really thin, and that contributes to, to, to people just feeling like, that. maybe, maybe I need to do things like this for my career. Um, so for us, uh, talk a little bit about what the recruiting experience at Northern Counties is like. Um, you know, 
I know that health care reform and payment reform is on top of most uh, health care administrators' minds, but it's not the thing that keeps me awake at night. The thing that keeps me awake at night is trying to figure out where our future workforce is going to come from. Um, and we've really take, we've decided, made a conscious decision to take an all hands on deck approach to solving the problem. It really takes all, the entire team, all of us working together within my team and with our partners to try to find and recruit professionals to come from in our areas. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, the last uh, physician I recruited a year and a half ago, uh, guy, mid-30s, has three kids. Uh, they're about my kid's age. Um, um, when, when we were recruiting him to the area, um, his wife spent uh, an afternoon with my wife driving around the area, showing her different beauties and neighborhoods. Um, his kids played with my kids. Uh, we had them over to dinner to my house and with a bunch of other staff making feel welcome and comfortable here. Because, because what you're doing is you're selling a lifestyle. You're selling, you're selling that the, when you join us, you're joining a family. That's really what it takes to, you know, another example, um, the dentist that I, I tried to recruit but failed, um, his wife had already been in the area. We had her over my house for Thanksgiving dinner because she was alone on Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, it's, it's those kinds of, like, it feels, it may feel crazy, but that's really what it takes to find the right kind of people to join our organization. Um, I also want to stress uh, lonely payment is critical. That is like the second question that a potential candidate asks when they when they are inquiring about a job opportunity in our area. The first question is, how does it pay? What does it work like? And then the second question is, well, what do you offer for lonely payment? And, and if you don't have a good answer for that, then the next step is a hang up of the phone, right? Because, because we are competing. These people have such great opportunities nationally that, um, that we need to be competitive in that environment. Um, and then finally, I kind of touched on this briefly earlier, but um, you know, you're recruiting the whole family, not just the person. You know, you're, you're, you, you, have to, you have to convey that this is a lifestyle choice that, that, that the entire family is making and uh, try, to, try to find ways to engage the entire family in that process. And then finally, um, collaboration with your part, local partners is key. Uh, because you are trying to find a job for that stranding spouse. You end up being a part of that conversation no matter what. You network hard um, to, to, to bring that person to the fold. Uh, so, there you go. Thank you, Sean. That was uh, quite eye-opening. Dustin. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the chair. Uh, you must be as happy as I am to not be getting petitions signed right about now and staring at a pile of signs you don't have to put out anymore. And who would have thought we'd have retired the same year? I'd love to find a way to recycle them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. So my name is Dustin Degree. I'm a former state senator from Franklin County. I live on the pretty side of the mountain uh, from Sean. Um, <laughs> and uh, in November, I left uh, that seat in the Senate to come work with Ms. Buxton uh, as part of Governor Scott's workforce in, uh, in a labor force development team. Um, part of the, the, the eye-opening things that you're seeing in the healthcare workforce uh, are not unique to this industry. If you go and talk to any manufacturer around the state, any small business looking to grow, uh, any, any, um, you know, any job that really requires some sort of skill other than a, a high school diploma, you're going to hear the same exact things that you hear from hospitals and home care providers. And um, The one major difference we might see is the fact that um, Healthcare is one of the few industries that we're seeing a greater usage of, right? So as that, as Vermont gets older, uh, we need more docs and we need more PAs and we need more folks really in the system uh, because we, even with a stagnant population, the population that accesses healthcare is growing. Uh, so that's something that's really unique to this sector. Uh, I think Sarah and my um, uh, strategies have been a, a little more holistic. Uh, when I came on in November, she was well on her way to developing uh, a workforce expansion plan that we put basically all the, the best ideas that we had, um, things like enhancing money for, for CTE, uh, creating uh, a program uh, called Returnships for 55 plus folks who are looking to re-enter the um, workforce after, um, after an outage for some reason or another. Um, and we we're able to get some of that passed. So what I'm really interested in as we go back to the drawing board after this legislative session, 
uh, is how we can focus on health care for the next bite of the apple that we have. And certainly the people here are the experts. I'm not an expert on health care policy. Turns out I don't even spell it right because I typically use two words. Um, but I'm happy to, here to be, uh, happy to be here to listen. Uh, and certainly anything that we can uh, bring back and, and try to put in legislative form and convince our former colleagues that it's the right thing to do, um, happy to help. Good afternoon. Thank you also for inviting me. My name is Sarah Buxton, and I'm the Director of Workforce Policy and Performance for the Department of Labor. And I'll uh, just sort of briefly describe my area of activity, and then I'm sure we'll get into some of the details as we uh, circle back through. But my job is to um, uh, is a unique position that was created to develop and implement strategies in the state that both expand the labor force and strengthen the, wor the workforce. And I just want to pause for a moment there to make sure folks understand that those are two different things, expanding the labor force and strengthening the workforce. They require different sets of partners, different, um, uh, different types of strategies, different types of investments from all over the place. Um, the other thing that I've worked a lot on in the last year and will continue to work on, um, as Dustin mentioned, is trying to steer an interagency comprehensive um, labor force expansion plan. And so there are a number, probably at least a dozen or so strategies that inside of state government we're trying to work on to better align and coordinate what we're doing around workforce. Again, both to expand the labor force and to strengthen the workforce. Um, major partners there are the obvious ones, Agency of Human Services, Agency of Education, Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And then finally, within the Department of Labor, I'm really focused on, <clears throat> excuse me, if you didn't know this, Department of Labor is about 98% federally funded. And so the way that we use our dollars and the way that our labor funds are used to support Vermonters in accessing um, uh, employment services are limited somewhat to the federal guidelines. But my role in the last uh, six to eight months has really been to dive into some of the, uh, the federal funding streams like WIOA, the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, um, our apprenticeship grant programs, our uh, dislocated worker grant programs, to see where there are opportunities for us to um, reinterpret what the federal guidelines say. Um, we have been asked to um, submit applications for waivers when we think that's appropriate for the state in order to make those federal dollars uh, a little bit more flexible for us here in the state. So I'm spending a lot of my time um, trying to pick those pieces apart and work with partners to come up with some um, options for all of us to look at as time passes. So Sarah, before you pass that on, you yeah. mentioned the Agency of Education. Yes. And I'm just curious, um, you know, so often we hear Vermonters complaining about our number one export is our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, it, it seems to be in conflict with the fact that we know there are all these really good paying jobs with really good benefits. Are you reaching out to guidance counselors across the state so that they can get information to kids as they're trying to make their career decisions so that they know that these opportunities exist? Yes, and actually um, beyond just reaching out and doing an information exchange, we're funding, uh, we're funding one and about to fund another uh, variation of pilots. One is in Rutland County where we've hired um, we're working with Reddick and with the local Workforce Investment Board to hire a position called a job coach working in Mill River and in Otter Valley. Um, and this individual would be the person who's connecting not with the students who already are working with their guidance counselors to go to college, not with the really um, at-risk students who are working with guidance counselors on a number of other areas and just sort of keeping in school, but with that middle segment of um, Vermont students to help, help them plan for what comes next. So uh, Rutland County is one area where we're taking a, um, using a model that's been used in other states of job coaches. Um, and then in Wyndham County, there's another model that the um, uh, VRCC, Brattleboro Regional Credit Corporation, um, is using it's a, a six high school consortium with a career counselor as opposed to a guidance counselor. And again, a very designated a position that has connections with employment as opposed to you know, student success within the school system. And so in the next um, year, 18 months, 
I'd like to see if we can do another pilot of some other variation in, a, in another part of the state and start to figure out what really works for Vermont in helping those students um, be connected the day after graduation to a plan. Okay. Uh, are, are we passing the mic as we go? Oh, didn't know there was one, but you can use it. <laughs> Full help. <laughs> could you hear everything I said? Yeah, we, we could. <laughs> I probably don't need it either. I'll talk loud. My name's Julie Tesler. I work at Vermont Care Partners uh, for over 21 years now. Vermont Care Partners is both the provider network and the trade association for the designated community mental health centers that provide developmental disability services, mental health services, and the majority also provide substance use disorder services. Um, we serve over 35,000 Vermonters each year, but we touch the lives of more because when there's things happen like a crisis in a school, we're serving the whole school. Uh, we serve whole communities. So we really reach more than just the clients we serve. We see ourselves as part of the healthcare system, but our work is very expansive. So some of the work we do is helping people become employable. And actually in developmental services, we have some of the highest rates of getting people back in the workforce or participating in the workforce of any state in the country. And we've gotten international recognition for the work we do there. And that's actually a very important part of recovery in both some use disorders and mental health is to have an active job as well as to have housing. So we really look at the social determinants of health. We employ over 13,000 Vermonters. We're actually a very large employer. Unfortunately, because of our funding levels, a number of our employees are only contract employees because we, mostly, because we can't afford the health benefits. Those contracted employees are often directly employed by the people they're serving or by shared living providers, also known as foster care. So they're not dir all direct employees of the um, agencies that I represent. Um, I know some of you haven't heard much about our services, and I, this isn't a good time to give you the whole overview. There's not time to do that. But what I brought is our outcomes report. And maybe you can take a look. And we'd love to have you come and visit our agencies because there's so much we do. And the, only, the best way to get a sense of that is to come out. And I know that uh, Robin's done that. She spent a, more than a day, I think, doing that. Um, Jessica has, too. And we really appreciate that. So we welcome anyone to come and see the work that we do. Um, and I'll talk more about employment as we go around and continue. That's a good idea. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a, a, a very loud voice. So my name is Dr. Jean-Marie Havener. I am the director of the nursing program at Castleton University in Castleton, Vermont. A great school. Thank you. <laughs> I think so, too. I'm a nurse. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I have my PhD in nursing with an emphasis on rural health and health policy. Um, I've been engaged in practice since 1981. Um, I know what it's like at the coal face. Um, I know what it's like to be feeling and experiencing shortages. I'm also a donor. Um, the daughter of um, an 87-year-old mom who is struggling right now to, to find good health care, to experience a good quality of life. I'm the director of a nursing program. We serve um, over 200 students, 85% of them that come from Vermont. Um, I feel pretty intimately engaged and involved in what it is that we're talking about today. Um, I want to echo everything that Sean had to say. I think that um, you know I'm also a person who serves as the chair of uh, the board of trustees of a small rural hospital with a rural critical access hospital under its corporate umbrella. So I know all <laughs> of this from pretty much every angle. And I'm, I'm very glad that you're convening this today. I think this is an important discussion to be having. 
I think that the models that we currently have for financing, healthcare, healthcare education, and for workforce development, and the models for education and training are broken, and that we really need to seriously reconsider how it is that we're doing things so that we can better serve the public. So I thank you very much. Jim, before you pass the mic, is, is there a way for Castleton to expand the number of graduates in the nursing program? Um, expansion of uh, graduates, the numbers whom we serve, are based on a couple of different things. So one is the availability of faculty. So we need to meet certain regulations in terms of faculty qualifications. Um, so that's one aspect of things. So you need to have that workforce. Um, the other thing is that when we look at how it is that we pay individuals like myself, so I'm a pretty darn qualified person in my field. Um, yesterday on the phone, I received an offer for a different position in a different state from uh, a person whom I had worked with before for $172,000. Um, I have no shame in telling you that I make $85,000. As a nurse practitioner, I made $110,000. In my previous position, I made $120,000. The reason that I'm here is because I believe in rural and I believe in, in helping to, to be a solution, and it's not all about money. But I work with a faculty um, who maybe don't have the same um, privilege and support that I have at home to be able to afford to make those sacrifices. Um, last year, I spent a good portion of my summer writing a report to the chancellor about um, nursing workforce, nursing faculty workforce issues, um, our salaries, and our workload. Um, when you take a look at what a nursing faculty member works compared to a regular faculty, it's pretty awe-inspiring. Um, we do not get compensated. Um, at the same rate as those individuals who work in the classroom. Yet, we're taking care of human beings. Their lives are in our hands. We're overseeing <laughs> groups of students, God bless them, who are newbies, uh, willing to take the chance and try. But, um, you know, it's, it's high risk taking work. So. Um, there's that challenge. There's the challenge of trying to find clinical placements. So right now, we, we are situated pretty close to the border of New York. Um, we have for 60 years used as one of our learning laboratories the Glens Falls Hospital, um, which is a, a wonderful facility. About 10% of our graduates end up working there. Um, and this past year, because of legislation in New York State, we are being asked to apply for per permission to continue to operate. Uh, the cost for the application is roughly about $20,000. Uh, we will pay about $7,500 a year to be able to continue to have that privilege. and. Um, in five years, we have to reapply again. And we're not doing the same thing for those agencies that lie on the border between New York State and Vermont who are coming into Vermont and, and working. So we have a, a problem, particularly in the specialties. Uh, so in the areas of obstetrics, in pediatrics, psychiatric mental health, uh, those are real issues for us in terms of finding um, what I would say are good training laboratories for our students. So um, in Vermont and across the nation, we're not alone in this. Um, what most regulatory agencies have said is that you can substitute some of what it is that you're doing in clinical settings with medium and high fidelity simulations. That requires having a lab. That requires having lab space. That requires the ability to purchase simulators. The simulators themselves cost sixty to $100,000 a piece. 
Um, they break down. It requires having individuals who have the training to be able to um, teach students and use this equipment. And those people are a rarity. And those people can earn incredibly high salaries. Um, so those are our challenges. We would love to be able to expand. I sit on our Student Affairs Committee, and we look at the applications that come through. And currently, um, because faculty are only hired on a 10-month <laughs> salary, I have to depend on people who are willing to come in with no compensation over the summer and spend time with me every week or every two weeks to look at these applications. Um, right now, I can tell you I have six people sitting in the queue waiting for me to tell them, can you come or not? Um, the university is being hit right now. Um, there's a, a deficit. There, you know, we're having to right size and realign and whatnot. And my department has been hit by by those changes. So these are all things that impact on the ability for us to be able to expand. I know how to do it. I've done it before. Um, I know what needs to be done. Um, I just need the tools. I really need the tools. I've got the toolkit, but I need the tools so that I can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Steve Gordon, CEO at Bravo Memorial Hospital in the Banana Belt of Vermont. It's a pleasure to come up here not and not have to present my budget. Of Trey gets the award for the farthest, uh, I'm not sure if you get the award or if Trey gets the award for the farthest driving. I think Bennington... It was a beautiful day, and there was no snow on the road, so it made it even better. Um, you know, I, I guess from my perspective, um, there's not an easy solution to this. And I look around this table, um, whether it's Liz or Candace or others, that we have partnerships with. And if we're going to solve this issue, it's about breaking out of our silos, linking up the educational institutions with, in my case, the hospitals, and developing programs to meet our needs, as opposed to just generating degrees. And I think um, we've, we have a great example of that, which when we come back around, hopefully we'll have time to do that, about a, a relationship we've had with CCV uh, for medical assistance, which are really critical to our operation. And um, um, it's uh, in its third year, and it's been a great program for us. And I think it is a, can be an example for the rest of the state. But it's going to be about partnerships that we develop amongst the higher, um, uh, higher education institutions, um, the hospitals home health care to really meet those uh, needs. And there are some um, really interesting programs out there. So I look forward as we come back uh, to talk a little bit more about it. Hi, I'm Liz Cody, and I'm the director of the UVM Office of Primary Care and the Area Health Education Centers Program, AHEC. And we are a healthcare workforce development organization. And we've existed in Vermont for 22 years. I've worked with this organization for 13 years. In your packet, there is a visual of the work that we do and the, the pipeline, how we, how we pursue healthcare workforce development. It's a pipeline that starts with Vermont's youth. We have programs for middle school students, high school students to get them in, interested in health careers and inspired and to give them hands-on um, opportunities. We continue that work through the undergraduate years um, and then into health professions, training programs, working with nursing students, medical students. Um, and, and then we continue that pipeline to work with medical residents um, and to recruit and re uh, help recruit and retain the current health workforce, uh, particularly primary care. Um, we administer the state's educational loan repayment program. Many of you are familiar with that. That program currently exists for primary care practitioners, physicians, nurse practitioners, certified nurse midwives, PAs, psychiatrists, dentists, um, nurses, LPNs, and RNs. We um, 
also have a position in our office called the physician placement professional. And this person works with the recruiters, the hospitals, federally qualified health centers, and private practices around the state to understand their primary care and other medical um, physician vacancies. And works to match UVM College of Medicine graduates and UVM Medical Center residents and fellows with those vacancies in Vermont. So we're trying to keep them here in Vermont. Um, so we start at the beginning with, with the kids, trying to grow our own. And then once they're here in training, we try to um, match them with an appropriate site in Vermont. Currently, we have 99 physician vacancies posted with our office. 44 of those are in primary care. 55 are in specialty care. Of the 55 in specialty care, we have five in psychiatry, four, five in orthopedic surgery, six in emergency medicine, and seven um, hospitalist positions. Um, we have additional data that I've shared with you in your packets about the counties that those positions are located and then the type of practice setting where those vacancies are. In this work, um, Educational loan repayment is, is, a, is a big factor. Um, and I would like to just read a quick statement about educational loan repayment, and then I will pass the mic. I also hope that when uh, later in this uh, program we can get back to talking a little bit more about the mental health workforce, particularly psychiatry, substance use disorder professionals, and also dental. Um, those are two things that I really hope we can get back to. Increasing educational cost and the corresponding increasing educational debt are very concerning. Each year, the cost of higher education becomes less affordable for U.S. individuals and families. Federal, state, and private financial aid programs contribute while students are enrolled, then contribute again after degree completion through loan repayment and loan forgiveness programs. As a consequence, high educational debt is shifting more of the cost of higher education to future employers. And in this example, the healthcare sector. In the context of the current educational financing system, the need for educational loan repayment assistance becomes more evident every year and plays an important role in recruiting and retaining the healthcare professionals Vermont needs most. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alan Rogers and I serve as the academic dean for Vermont Technical College and I'm responsible for our 38 programs and approximately 130 full and part-time faculty members. Among those 38 programs there are seven that are related to nursing and healthcare. Uh, they cover four different disciplines. This year we'll graduate over 300 uh, in those various disciplines. Over 90% of them are Vermonters, and most of them will continue to stay and work in Vermont. Uh, in terms of what our small window is on the universe, based on our conversations with advisory board members, so every program has an advisory board, the uh, greatest workforce, need, workforce needs include radiologists, uh, nurses, particularly long-term care nursing, EMT and paramedics, and of course, docs and, and dentists. Um, and I guess just to tell you where we are in this process, um, recognizing these various needs, we are hoping to open a dental therapy program in the fall of 2020. So this, this is a, a new um, statutorily licensed position that sort of is the equivalent of a registered uh, a um, uh, nurse practitioner in the medical field and we would be if, if successful we would be the first state to be able to have that particular licensing available we're also hoping uh, given the closure of champlain college's respiratory program we're hoping to open that program uh, at vermont tech in the fall of 2019 and given i appreciate the comments about the other parts of healthcare, uh, we're looking at um, opening up a healthcare management track in our business program.
My name is Candace Lewis, and I'm an Associate Academic Dean for the Community College of Vermont, and I work with our science and allied health programs. Um, I see CCV as kind of a conduit that helps um, students who are in secondary programs in the medical professions and otherwise to start gaining some college credit and some awareness of healthcare um, opportunities um, before they leave high school. But we also um, provide entry-level programs for those positions in healthcare um, that truly do um, require um, a year or two of education and, and not much more. Um, and in addition to that, we also provide programs that help as a, uh, provide a springboard into more highly skilled uh, degree programs at the associate or baccalaureate level. Um, one of the things that I, um, one of my counterpart at VTC shared with me was that over 70% of the applicants for the LPN program at VTC have done prior coursework through CCV. Um, and I think our role as being an affordable and accessible throughout the state educational provider is, is one of the reasons for that. Um, I do think uh, one of the challenges that we have is, um, is or that our student body has, is that um, the flexibility that they find at CCV sometimes in order to meet some of those program prerequisites, um, then they don't find that same flexibility in terms of trying to complete specialized programs in healthcare. Um, and I know that for all of the reasons that Jean Marie just stated, um, there are a lot of, of barriers to providing that kind of flexibility for nursing programs. But that's something that I think as a state we might want to think about. Um, I also think one of the challenges that we have is keeping pace with some of the innovations that our um, healthcare partners are making. So as um, organizations are trying to better figure out how to more efficiently use those highly skilled providers and what kinds of positions are they going to bring into the workforce, you know, CCV can play a role in providing some of the educational opportunities for those new support uh, positions. We've been hearing a lot about population health workers and people that can kind of do some care coordination pieces um, or preventative care measures. And so those are some of the opportunities that we look for in the future. In addition, um, as Steve mentioned, we have the, the partnership with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. And I think for the med assisting program, one of the things that we are trying to get a handle on is exactly, you know, exactly what is that level of education that needs to, to that, that students need in order to find employment in the field? Because I think we don't want to, we don't want to overshoot and ask more of our students than is necessary for employment. Um, but we also want to be sure that we are providing students with the skills they need to be successful. Good afternoon, my name is Nolan Atkins. I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Northern Vermont University, and I'm just going to take a second to explain what that is. <laughs> um, Northern Vermont University is the, the merger of two of the other state schools that, uh, actually we're all five represented here, uh, the merger of Linden State College in Lindenville, Vermont, in the Northeast Kingdom, and Johnson State College in, in Johnson, Vermont. Um, back in September of 2017, the Board of Trustees approved the merger of these two institutions. And since then, we've been working very hard to, to unify both institutions to become this one uh, university. We are regionally accredited as of July 1 of 2018, three and a half weeks from now, uh, to operate as this institution. And in the next uh, two and a half weeks, we expect to have approval from the U.S. Department of Education to award uh, federal Title IV, Title IV financial aid funds as well. So that is, in a nutshell, what this institution is. So I'm here really to share with you the healthcare-related um, degree programs that we offer on both campuses. Uh, so starting with, with the Johnson campus, um, and actually also on the Linden campus, both have pretty robust programs in psychology and uh, human services. And many of the students that come to these programs come from Vermont and they stay in Vermont and enter uh, many uh, human services related uh, fields and professions here in Vermont. On the Johnson campus, there's also a program um, in wellness and alternative medicine. And uh, probably the most robust program on the Johnson campus that, that really has a pretty firm 
uh, imprint here in Vermont is the master's program in clinical me mental health counseling. Um, a couple years ago, the president commissioned a study just to, to look at the, the impact of that program uh, here in Vermont. And in the decade from 2006 to 2016, they estimated that about 10% of the licenses issued in mental health counseling, those folks actually were enrolled in the, the Johnson program. To Sean's point about what's happening in the Northeast Kingdom, we do plan to, in the fall of 2019, offer that program on the Linden campus, and so uh, that program will start up there, and hopefully we'll begin to address the acute need for mental health counseling and addictions-related services in that, that part of Vermont. Uh, additionally, on the Johnson campus, uh, there is a health science degree that offers um, areas of fo focus in exercise science, pre-physical therapy, and uh, physical education. And a number of those folks, particularly in the physical therapy concentration, will go off to graduate school. And, and I would have to say that many of them don't stay in the state of Vermont. Um, on the Linden campus, uh, an additional program in exercise science has concentrations in strength and conditioning, um, athletic training, another concentration in pre-physical therapy, and, and I'm quite familiar that many of those students do go on to graduate school and, and do leave the state. Um, and finally, the, the, it's not really a program, but we have a feeder program in pre-nursing that feeds the, uh, the Vermont Tech nursing program at, on the London campus as well. So just a quick overview of the types of programs that are offered on, on the two campuses that comprise Northern Vermont University. I'm surprised you didn't have a new hat or something to, for the brand. I have a new name tag. The there you go. I can get you a tie in about two weeks. Okay. <laughs> It's a good looking name tag, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> nice logo. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Jim Yoliger. I'm a family physician in Heinsberg, and I'm uh, Vice President of Operations for the Medical Group of the University of Vermont Health Network. The, um, I'd like to make some connections because, you know, I came mostly prepared to talk about our uh, recruitment of providers, and, and I will, but. Um, it strikes me that almost everything everybody's saying resonates completely, even though as an organization, certainly we have a little different scale. The issues are really very much similar, if not the same. Um, one of the features was, um, and it, it's brilliant that we're thinking of much more than the provider workforce here, because the practice of medicine and healthcare has always been a team sport, but it is that so much more now than it was even five to ten years ago. The things we are asking, so, so if we're going to use our physician workforce well and our nursing workforce well, they need to be doing things that physicians and nurses are uniquely qualified to do. And the number of things there are to do as our patients get sicker and our payment systems get more complex, there's just more to do. So that relies on having a very um, skilled and reliable workforce to support all of that. Um, and for a lot of those positions, I mean, the things that are, we used to ask of our medical assistant, they put you in the room, they took your blood pressure, and they may have drawn your blood. We have, particularly in primary care, it's very complex. We have a number of protocols we're asking them to follow. Um, and to great success, um, I had a patient that I took care of for a long time who was declining colon cancer screening. And I, forgive me, I may have told this story before. I, I, my kids would say I have, because they I repeat <laughs> stories. But she, um, declining colon cancer screening, I had stopped asking her. This My medical assistant was following the protocol. She came in, she said, hey, you know, she's here for whatever, but uh, is ready for colon cancer screening. I set up the order, you just have to sign it. I didn't think, there was nothing I did. I pushed the button, I signed it. She had an early colon cancer, and that, that you know, high school level, or maybe associate's degree person saved this individual's life. And it's, it, it's very profound. And it's not necessarily the skills that we're looking for um, are, you know, the ability to follow a protocol, to show up on time, to do, to take care of people in difficult situations with a smile on your face. So, so we're, that's, that's a very important thing is how we leverage the team. Um, at the Medical Center in terms of providers, um, I was also struck. 
it's important to understand that um, as physicians and other providers, even though patients experience, are experiencing us as individuals, it's very much a collegial um, field. People do well, they perform better, they're happier when they have a number of colleagues. So um, when I was thinking of North Country Hospital, I trained with uh, the good Rachel DeSanto, who I think is up in your way. So, um, and she's tried to get me to come your way many times. She's, she's great, yeah, we'll meet afterwards. Um, You'll be invited to the next barbecue. Yeah, right, that's right, good. My boss isn't here, so we're, we're good. Um, but if you're, say, trained in Burlington and you're thinking, gosh, I have 40 colleagues here all in family medicine, I'd be practicing with nine or 10 of them in my site, I have residents, I have all these things, you know, it looks a little different when you go out to North Country. Uh, in many ways, and maybe for the better, but there's, there's, you, you're giving up a couple things there too. We get that same experience from a neurologist finishing his or her movement disorder fellowship in Boston or New York City, is looking up at here, here in Vermont saying, gosh, lovely quality of life, we love the place. A lot of our successful recruitments are because of Vermont. But you know, here in uh, New York, there's five fellows that do all the work, and there's uh, you know, uh, 40 uh, colleagues right in my specialty, and there's one other one of me in Burlington. And so it's the same issue, it's a, it's a little bit different, but it's the same too. Burnout's also been a big issue. So, so how are we addressing some of these things? So um, with one of the things that helped is the network, um, that is helping is the network. Um, there are certain positions, one of them is in psychiatry, that we, a lot of our psychiatrists, they really want to work for an academic center. Um, and there are clinical positions um, here in the capital region that, that had a difficult time being filled. When we changed those to academic positions that were reporting to our chair of psychiatry, it, all of a sudden we were able to recruit some psychiatrists. So people were connected to the family, even though there were maybe only three or four psychiatrists, I don't know how many particular psychiatrists there are in that practice, but all of a sudden they have 30 or 40 colleagues because, again, it's a collegial practice. So the network is helping. Um, we are looking at burnout and wellness. We need to be able to, uh, you know, as you know, we're putting a, an expanding uh, and upgrading our electronic health record. That is key um, to, uh, to recruiting physicians, because, not just because we're putting it in, because that new record is able to do things more efficiently than we've been able to do in the past. It's much less of a burden. There are efficiency tools. We're also investing in the training of new providers. That's a, that's a medical center board meeting tomorrow I have to advocate for that, so I'm confident we'll be investing in the training of our providers, which has been linked to provider happiness with their electronic health record, not just one year down the line, but if your initial onboarding is good, it improves your happiness with your electronic health record five years down the line, not just one year down the line. So we're doing a number of these, um, we're setting up mentors, I have to check my list. Oh, and then the other thing that both helps recruiting, but it also helps us make really good use of the providers that we have are some innovative things we're starting to do and would like to do more of um, around um, uh, innovative access. So asynchronous visits or electronic consults. You know, if, if, um, you know, I, if I'm concerned about it, you know, I think that mole's okay. I don't think you need to see a dermatologist. Boy, I don't really want to tie up that dermatologist's time, and we only have so many. But if I could shoot them a picture, they can, in, in less time than they could see that patient, they say, you know what, that looks fine. Or, hey, why don't you biopsy that, which I can do in my office. And um, what's making that possible is payment reform. Um, going to fixed payments and value-based care is absolutely what's allowing us to do that, because those are entirely unreimbursed services, um, or at least they were traditionally in a fee-for-service. And now, you know, if, if the payment is fixed, whether that specialist sees the patient or not, it allows us to be a lot more innovative. So if I think of things that you could advocate for as a board, is as new and innovative things come around like that, it, it may take, I think fixed payment is going to cover a lot of them, but it may not cover all of them. So we need to be innovative. And when we do, when we, when we talk about those uh, types of things, the, particularly the younger um, providers that are interested in doing things a little bit differently than they've been done, they get really excited. And if we can offer something a little bit more cutting edge um, than they perceive even in Boston, New York, because we have this um, fixed payment system, that's something, that's something uniquely Vermont that we could offer them. So. Um, this is some of the things, so I enjoyed it. Before you pass the mic, James, I just 
was hoping that you might be able to address, um, you know, so often we hear um, through emails and letters and phone calls about problems with wait times and um, s some very dramatic stories where people feel that um, in some respects it becomes um, life-threatening wait times. And so I just wanted to, um, since you have members from the education community, the administration, and others on the panel up there with you, maybe you could talk about the correlation between someone's ability to access care, which is part of our triple aim, and the workforce dilemma. Well, that's the, the connections between the workforce dilemma and access. Um, it's really in those most difficult to recruit specialties. Um, and I, you know, I, I have a list of um, our recruitments that have, that are currently open. I've highlighted those that have gone over uh, six months or so. And they're mostly in psychiatry and neurology or two ones that, if you ask around the country when, when you go to conferences, they say, oh yeah, psychiatry and neurology, you know, everybody starts nodding their heads. So these are, there's national issues with these specialties. But there's also some that are just, we only have a couple of them or they're very, they're, the, the, the medical education system may only produce a few of those specialties a year. Um, and again, we don't have so many colleagues, et cetera. So from a, from a physician workforce in those higher end specialties, that's, uh, oh gosh, as a primary care provider, I shouldn't put it that way. Way. And those more nuanced specialties, <laughs> um, that can be a challenge. So, um, you know, and there are things particularly that we don't offer training for. So they're just, we don't have the patient work, um, the patient's population that it would take to support a pediatric cardiothoracic training program. It just, we don't have that. Um, we have invested in some training programs that we didn't have previously. Child psychiatry is a good example. We've had three or four successful recruitments from our own child psychiatry fellowship, which, was, which is relatively new. Um, so to the degree to which we can offer those training, um, those training opportunities to providers, it helps us train our own. Um, and I think particularly some of the, the, you know, Castleton, I had a, you know, one of our great success stories, we had a, a medical assistant came right out of high school. She took a love to it. She went to the Castleton program and now she's one of our great RNs on the floor. You know, those success stories are, are wonderful, but it took a few rounds to get into Castleton maybe because... <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> but she did. She's doing great. She's doing great. But, um, but it's really that supportive work. For most of the people here at, at this table, it's really helping us with that supportive workforce because the more we can get our support workforce to function, the higher we can have our providers function. So I'm Trey Dobson. I'm the Vermont Medical Society president for this year. So I get to hear from a, a lot of uh, physicians and physician assistants around the state, uh, mostly via email, sometimes through calls. And I'm also the chief medical officer at SVMC and the director of our Dartmouth-Hitchcock group. And I spend uh, almost 50% of my time recruiting, which is not what I imagined when I took my role. And I think many of you do the same, whether you're a CEO or a vice president. Um, I'll just echo some of the comments real quickly. Um, um, Sean, well out, you know, well outlined in the very beginning all the stressors. Um, Steve talked about some approaches that we have to do with partnerships with education, and that's actually very important. We're trying to do the same thing. We should learn from each other. But I guess I'm very interested in moving towards solutions, not necessarily today, but developing those. Um, James used the word innovative. I'll start using the word novel. I think that we need to do three things. One is we need to figure out how to better target people around the United States who want to live in Vermont. Um, versus just blanket recruiting type efforts because that's a lot of waste. The second is I think we have to be more immigrant friendly and find ways to get more immigration into this area. And third, I think we have to be very novel. We're novel in a lot of ways in healthcare, but we're not in workforce development. We offer the same things, sometimes less, than other parts around the country. What could we do to be novel? I don't have the answer to that, but I'll throw some things out. Could we develop tenure tracks for nurses and physicians where they are sort of held here and then they get a lot of benefit after a while, including um, sabbatical time, things that decrease burnout at the same time as maybe increased retention. Um, I don't have the answers to that, but uh, I very much appreciate this forum, but I'd like to start developing some committees to look towards solutions. Of course, we have to figure out how to pay for that, and we'd also have to be novel in that response as well. 
So um, I guess uh, I'll start off the questioning here, and I'm going to throw this out to uh, Liz, because we just heard what Trey said, and one of the conversations that uh, uh, I think back about uh, many times is the conversation that um, I had with you in my office about how it, it seemed to me to be simple. This is what we need to do. We need to offer a, a scholarship where they have to work in Vermont when they're done, so it has to be flipped. and then. Um, you gradually eased me into your discussion of how it becomes an arms race. And I thought maybe if you could share that discussion with others here today, um, that it isn't always as easy as doing something, because once we do something, that's not the be all and end all, because it may work for a short period of time until everybody else copies you, and so on. So could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, so the arms race is because we're competing nationally for these highly trained, high, highly skilled professionals. And we, you know, 25 years ago, Vermont was one of the first states to offer educational loan repayment. It was an innovation. It was novel. We had a leg up. And it was great. And we offered scholarships with future service commitments um, through funding from the Freeman Foundation. Foundation. Again, we, it was, we had a leg up. Um, now, almost every state has an educational loan repayment program for, for health professionals and for physicians. So it's no longer a leg up. It's the new baseline. It's expected. Those conversations with, with um, recruiters and employers, if you don't have it, you're, you're at a disadvantage. But if you have it, you're now just, it's just the new baseline. It's equalizing the footing. So we have to keep those things going or, or we have a disadvantage. Um, scholarships for future service commitments. In Vermont, we relied on private funding for that. That funding has now ended. Um, we also, one of the, the challenges with a program like that is that many of these folks have many more years of training to go, whether it be through medical school or train, uh, residency or fellowship. So their decisions as far as which specialty of medicine that they might want to practice in the future changes. And we're committing early in their training, um, sometimes maybe unfairly early. And then their personal lives change. They go on to residency in another state, and they, they meet somebody, a new partner, and uh, they have new considerations. And so getting them back to Vermont, um, even when they have those future service obligations, can be a challenge. So I think we need to think cr more creatively. And we, I, I believe that we need, need to maintain many of these programs that we have uh, to um, keep that baseline. Um, but new things. Since you gave me the mic, can I just ask? <laughs> Preceptors, um, Jean Marie talked about this, and I, I heard it um, a couple other times. The clinical sites for trainees, whether it be medical students or nursing students, PT, pharmacy, um, any of the training programs that require clinical training and um, out in the field, in medicine, it's the third year of medical school where it's a series of, of clinical rotations in different specialties. Some of these rotations are for six weeks. We want to get those students out into the field and experiencing all of Vermont, not just Burlington or Chittenden County. So we need to place, in this example, family medicine students, uh, uh, medical students on a family medicine uh, rotation or cl clinical clerkship um, at a site for six weeks. So we need a practice to be willing to take a student and help train that student. And that affects their care delivery time, their productivity. Um, we want their whole team to be involved. And so we ask them to do this as volunteers. It's a big ask. Um, but it's also an opportunity for those practice sites to, to um, meet these students and to develop long-range relationships, long-term relationships. So it's that cultivation. But sometimes it's so long-range that they can't see um, the benefit when they're already understaffed or overburdened with paperwork. So I think we need to spend some time thinking about how do we address um, preceptor development and clinical site development so that 
that we're not sending students who are training in Vermont to other states to get these experiences. Um, currently, we send some students to Maine, Florida, New York, Connecticut, um, because the, we do not have enough preceptor sites. We compete with other um, programs that pay preceptors. Dartmouth, for instance, will pay um, the clinical site to take um, students. So preceptor development is a big piece of um, helping students connect um, with practices around the state. And then also housing for those students when they're on those rotations. So if a student is in southern Vermont for six weeks, um, the AHEC program works to, to cultivate community-based housing and housing volunteers, people from the community willing to house a student for six weeks. Other states have come up with um, creative solutions in offering different kinds of uh, tax incentives, tax rebates, tax credits for um, preceptors as well as for housing hosts. So maybe those are things that we can look at in the future. Is there any empirical evidence over which of these strategies seems to work best for the, the, the most uh, cost efficient dollars? <laughs> I'm going to say no as far as empirical evidence. There's a lot of anecdotal. Um, one of the, the, the challenges of the evidence that we all want to see is the, long, the longitudinal tracking that's required to determine did that work and how much did it cost. So longitudinal tracking of participants in all of the programs that we do is really necessary in order to, to um, assess um, outcomes and success. Many of our funders um, want that, but they don't want to pay for the work that goes into the longitudinal tracking. We also work with many partners in uh, governmental organizations, licensing, who have data that would help with that process, but because of privacy laws or just red tape, it's very difficult to access that data. Um, in the education world, we, we deal with FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, as far as limiting sharing of data about students and where they are, and even how to contact them long term in healthcare. It's HIPAA, so HIPAA, FERPA. Um, so if we can figure out better ways to share information and data that, that we have um, in this workforce development effort, that would be really helpful. Thanks. Um, Dr. Holmes is going to ask the next question, and just so I prepare the other board members, after that I'm going to start with you, Robin, and work the way up the table and uh, alternate, and then after that I'm going to ask the panelists if they would like to ask the other panelists a question. So, Dr. Holmes. Lots of prep time there. Yes. Uh, if you want advice on data sharing, I suggest you talk to Facebook. They seem to have figured out how to do that. Um, but actually, and I was going to say, uh, Trey, you mentioned something about tenuring uh, nurses or providers in some way. I would say there's lots of lessons to be learned from academic institutions on golden handcuffs, to so to speak, sure. and um, from th you know, I could just say from things like uh, you know tuition benefits for dependents to uh, help with down payments and mortgages to you know escalating retirement. I mean, working at an academic institution, I can tell you that there are a lot of golden handcuffs that, that keep us there. Um, lessons learned from related work. But I guess one of, actually I actually have two questions, and I'll try and make them quick and open them up, and maybe some people can answer one or the other. Um, but I, my question is, is the issue more recruitment or retention? Because I would imagine that the strategies for solving that would be quite different. Um, so one of, you know, is it the problem that people don't enter the workforce because of all the host of reasons or that they, they come, they're, they're here for a little while and then they're lured away by larger salaries, you know, from other states or from other places. And so obviously one has implications for turnover costs, you know, constantly turning it over and having people, training them and having people leave or just not even be able to get people into the pipeline. So that would be the first question. And then a quickly a second question would be, I imagine for some areas when you were talking about the Northeast Kingdom that the population mass is small there. So I imagine that there's a critical mass needed for a specialist to want to move into that territory or even primary care um, to some degree, moving a new practice in. Um, there needs to be a, a population base to support that. So I'm wondering what role technology plays in telemedicine and or 
mobile units, like you were talking about dentists per capita there. And I'm wondering, you know, is there an innovation where there's a mobile dental bus that drives to the Northeast Kingdom and is there for two or three days and then drives to other, I mean, what can we do if we can't get people to move and, and reside in a particular community? Can we use technology, mobile, telemedicine to do that? So my first question, recruitment versus retention. And my second question, how can we use technology and, and mobile resources and move the providers in and out or move patients to those practices? I don't know, but so throw I, those out there. My advice start by doing the recruitment versus retention because I, it's both. Um, I imagined it was, but I mean, is there one weighted more than the other? Or? Uh, I, so I would say that uh, for us, um, the preponderance of the challenge is on recruitment. Okay. That, that's what we really struggle with to find workforce. Um, our workforce is aging. Our nurses are older. Our physicians are older. And, and so that gets to the retention piece, which is that um, we're not seeing people really flee because, because they can find a higher paying job elsewhere. Um, uh, we're seeing people retiring out of the workforce, and uh, we're seeing uh, providers, especially in primary care, burning out. So they're retiring early, or they're changing their career, so they're going to primary care to work as a hospitalist or any other. So, so I think the, 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 the opportunities around that are how do we, this gets back to quality of life, right? And, and you know, it's, it's leveraging technology to make, make that work easier. It's finding ways to take the administrative burden on them. Those are those are things that we are uh, exploring as an organization to try to help keep people from there. Uh, you know, and, and again, you know, it's, we just added, um, we, we just updated our contracts, and we added, I think it was in there, but we added, um, we added the opportunity for our positions, anybody who's employed five years or more, every five years they can take a, uh, I think it's a 60-day category. So, you know, it's, it's doing those things. Now, we're going to have to cover that cost, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, their agents are going to be seen, but, but um, we recognize that and we're trying to use strategies like that to help people remain employed. Um, but it really, I think the bigger problem is the recruiting. And, and it's not, I mean, we have great, you know, education institutions here. We have great partners who are trying to support this. And sometimes, you know, people just aren't out there to talk to. You know, that's, you know, in you know, nursing, I like to use the, you know, there are this many nursing opportunities in the community, and there are this many nurses. You know, it just is, you know, so, so that's a challenge that we have to do. As far as technology, I will say all of the above. It is hard to adopt uh, new technology and, and um, leverage telemedicine in meaningful ways within our practices, especially when they get busy. But um, but I think that especially moving forward with um, with healthcare reform and payment reform, the opportunities are starting to open up. Yeah, and then I hard why. Sorry, you said it was hard so, to leverage so technology. So why is it hard? So um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a pilot, actually a little bit before I joined Northern County, but I heard a lot about it um, because it was an epic fail around trying to provide it. It was tele telepsychology. So here's an example of the problem. At that time, uh, you needed to have a monitor and a special connection. And you had to, everybody had to make sure it was secure. And then you had to schedule that. And then you had to figure out how to coordinate the schedule with the provider remotely with the patient when they came in. And oh, by the way, a third of our patients, no judgment, a third of our patients are living in poverty, right? Their lives are chaos. And we have a very high no show rate. So how do we deal with that, right? So, so, so that complicates the challenge of the people who need to care the most in that manner are the hardest ones to connect with remotely, it's a lot easier to, oh, thank God you showed up for your appointment. Let me grab the person next door. And, and so, so those are all very real barriers that we have to figure out how to overcome. It's, it's not, yeah, it, those are, the, plus, plus, again, no judgment, please, but um, my workforce, average age of physician, 55, 56 years old, right? They didn't grow up in a, in a YouTube, iPad, world, you know, so so the idea of interacting with people that way is also a cultural shift. I think our, as we see the younger generation of providers who are much more comfortable with technology coming into it, um, that's going to be easier for, but that, that too is a very, very
Yeah, I mean, I just uh, happen to have the mic here, so I'll say I agree with all of that. Recruitment seems to be, I mean, retention's always a problem. People are going to leave anyway because um, they're leaving for other reasons. They're leaving because they're distraught or uh, recruitment's the big thing. On telemedicine, uh, I know all of you and us included are working very hard on it because that is very helpful. Um, I have a presentation. It's not a panacea uh, because their biggest, their biggest concern is workforce. They don't have it either. Uh, there's not just like all these physicians and nurses sitting around saying, oh, if I would be working, but I'm not, but if I could do telemedicine, I would do this work. They don't exist either, so it's a, it's a combination that'll be there. I know I had a similar, um, so it's, it's, um, it's recruitment except in the highest burnout specialties, which are primary care and emergency medicine. For us and for much of the, um, and for there it's retention. We're definitely seeing early retirements. Um, for the technology, it's not as simple as having the technology because even for our pilots that we're doing for the e-consults, um, you know, I heard that, I got excited that I said, wait a minute, are we setting aside time for that dermatologist to go through those? And it's that dermatologist's time, which is extraordinarily valuable. So so if we were to provide teleDerm services for all of Vermont, which would be beautiful, like how do we, and then how do we schedule that? And then we're going outside of our fixed payment area, which is, which is fine, but then how do we fund that? And so all solvable, all solvable. The, the, the technologies have to be compatible. And by the way, hiring a technology workforce is becoming harder and harder. An IT workforce is very difficult. I mean, that's they're, they're being, and we're competing with, I mean, talk about competing for doctors, we're competing for IT salary, you know, at IT salaries all across the country. In the, the recruitment work that um, AHEC is involved, um, when working with uh, candidates, we always hear about pay and compensation package and benefits as, as being a huge concern. Um, but we also hear a lot about um, the workplace environment and the management of the workplace. So sometimes we refer candidates to practices and we've screened them and worked with these candidates for a while. So we believe the geographic location you know, might work for them and, and that, it, that it's a fit, it's a hot lead. At or at, least, at the very least a warm lead, not, not just a lead. And then we get the feedback of, well, the, the site is very outdated. Um, it's old. They don't have current technology. Um, even spotty internet sometimes. Um, and then just how the, the, the electronic um, health record, which, which record, how that's managed, um, and the general management of the site. These are things that incentive programs like loan repayment and workforce development programs cannot solve for. So these are other kinds of things that need to be addressed or self-assessment as far as employers and practice sites and what they can do as far as putting the, their best foot forward when they're work, working with recruits, in addition to the hospitality of barbecues and things like that. <laughs> So if I could just frame the, the, the problem, especially on the primary care side, because as you all know, when we did our budget review, we had three uh, full-time primary care physicians that retired, and that's about 6,000 patients that need to find a home. When you look at the data, and this was a study done by Merritt Hawkins, one of the big uh, recruitment firms, that of all the primary care residents that come out of their residencies, only 4% are even interested at looking at a rural or semi-rural area. They're much more interested in a suburban or urban area. So your, the numbers out there that are even interested in coming to a place like Vermont, whether it's southern Vermont, mid-Vermont, the Northeast Kingdom, whatever, is a very limited number. So one of the questions that we always, that we had was, how do we differentiate ourselves when we're out recruiting for these three new physicians? Well, one of the things we did, and we've talked about this at the Hospital Association, is at Broadbar we've established a scribe because we know how the electronic medical record can sometimes be a barrier between the physician and the patient because the physician is entering in the information. So now we have a scribe and we offer that to every new recruit. 
And that has made a difference because most other places aren't at that point. And actually now we're starting to leverage technology in having um, uh, a, uh, a virtual scribe in the room where now a scribe is on the internet via, and the patient knows this obviously, but the scribe is remote. So, so leveraging some of that technology now to um, differentiate ourselves in the marketplace and create a, a better environment for primary care physicians to bring back that joy of medicine um, that we sort of have lost because of all the bureaucracy and the regulatory uh, apparatus. But I, I don't want to leave you to think that it's all equal in terms of recruitment. That 4% is, and, and that 4% is competing throughout this country for jobs. So. Since we're moving down, down the track here, I'll take my, my few moments. So um, I just finished, uh, completed a, a research study with a number of my colleagues at a, a rural institution where we were, we had 600 nurses from rural healthcare organizations and we were looking at intention to stay and what it was that kept people in place. And I, I will tell you that our findings by and large very clearly said it's embeddedness. It has to do with being able to develop some roots in a place. So much like what Sean was talking about, though we laugh about the Thanksgiving dinner, it is those kinds of things because we live in a world where people are so, so busy. And while they may be enjoying what it is that they're doing at work, work is only one aspect of an individual's life. And so that individual themselves needs to feel connected within the communities in which they live, as well as their partners and their children. Um, and so I think these are important things for us to think about. It is not just, as you said, it's not just the, the things that are sort of obvious to us from the standpoint of you know creating a, a, a good job and a healthy workplace and providing people with supports and giving them the golden handcuffs. It's these other things that I think that we have to really be thinking about um, as we as we try to find solutions. Um, the one thing I also know from looking at today's post-secondary demographic, that first of all, it's shrinking. So that's one aspect of things. So I think as you, know, you had mentioned before, we're not ta talking just about expanding the labor force. We're talking about you know, creating new opportunities for individuals who are at a different point in their career. Maybe they've discovered that they're not so happy doing what it is they thought they would be happy at doing when they were 18 or you know, whenever they made their choice. Maybe they've been displaced from the economic marketplace. Maybe they're not able to make a uh, a living wage. Um, and so one of the things that I've seen in that literature is that only 13% of individuals in that post-secondary demographic choose to go to a rural place. So when I think about this from my standpoint and I think about the solutions that that we need to create. One of the things, my message is to everybody whom I encounter is that just as we have a bi-local movement when it comes to you know, our food sources, I think we need to have a bi-local movement when it comes to education. That we should really be encouraging the people who already <laughs> grew up here, who live here, whose families are rooted here, who have connections here. I think that we need to be thinking about how it is that we grow our own. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Mellon, that our, our biggest export here is, is our offspring. I think we need to think about how do we shift that? How do we do something different? How do we keep people here? You know, what are the what are the financial disincentives to going to school outside <laughs> or outside of, of Vermont? What are we doing here that's wrong? Why do they want to go elsewhere? You have a pretty healthy and robust pipeline system here, but they're leaving. And I think that we need to think about that as well. Um, 
So it's retention and, and recruitment, and your recruitment could be resolved pretty easily. <laughs> Thank you, I, I agree. Uh, it is both recruitment and retention, and um, the Johnson State program and a number of the programs here really have helped feed people into employment and community mental health. So we're really appreciative of the resources that we have that have fed people in. Um, let me give you an example, though, like of what happens when we can't recruit. I have a colleague whose uh, son uses augmentative communication to communicate. They haven't been able to recruit a staff who they'll be paying $14 an hour for, uh, for three or four months now. So during that time, they, the mental health center puts in subs when they can who can, has the skill to help them communicate. But very often, he's stranded in the home that he lives in, in a rural environment. He can't get out. He can't communicate. And in the past, when he's been in this situation, he's exploded in violence to a very dangerous degree. Um, she's very worried about him, and yet there's nothing, there's no concrete action that can be taken. We can't increase our salaries with higher payment rates. The agency is doing the best they can. But in the interim, someone is there not getting support and in getting an increasingly difficult situation. However, retention is also equally important. When you think about going to psychotherapy and talking about very painful personal experiences, for instance, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence, addiction that you can't get over and you keep relapsing, those are really hard stories to have to tell to a new therapist several times in a year. And we've had turnover rates of about 30%. So that's a real issue in community mental health, and I really hear my other healthcare partners talking about the issues they're dealing with. In our situation, we're in the, just looking at the Vermont labor market. We are so far behind the other players in the labor market, whether it's hospitals, other healthcare providers, schools, or the state of Vermont that also provides mental health services that we're struggling just within our own labor market. Um, so we've done comparisons with state employees doing similar work and found that our employees literally make $20,000 less a year doing exactly the same job at the same length of time. So if you'll see on the reports that I passed out, our employees love their work. They feel good, it's rewarding. There's, it's just wonderful work. But many of them leave to other health care employers in Vermont because they can't afford to stay. And when it's that much of a difference, and we're paying people with master's degrees in $30,000 range, you really can't blame them. And we do have some good luck in terms of recruiting the master's level because they can work for us before they get their license. So it takes about two years of supervision, you get your license, and then you leave. Um, but at least we get them for the two years. So we're appreciative of that, but um, we really need support from the Green Mountain Care Board to help us look at pay parity, funding parity, how could we really pay for the costs of services adequately? Um, can we use value-based payments? Can we work with the ACO to find a way to, to fully fund the work that we do? Because when people experience trauma, they're more likely to have health care issues later in life, whether it's related to addiction and behaviors or it's you know, other cardiovascular and other issues that occur because of the experience. Our work helps people with resilience, helps people with recovery, helps people to have healthier behaviors, but we need the staff to do the work and to do it well. And so without having a consistent quality workforce, people don't have access to good quality care that's really gonna make a difference in their lives, um, whether it's employment or health care. Or, or any aspects of their life. So um, glad to be part of this panel today and be able to present this. I don't have any comments on this question, <laughs> but I can't wait for the point in this conversation where we can look at the opportunities that we've already discussed, but points of connection. Robin. I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about substance abuse and the substance abuse issues in workforce um, around the state. 
I'll just start by telling you that we have an opportunity in front of us, and then I'm going to listen very carefully for what others say. The federal government has put out a um, an RFP for states to apply for up to, I think we're, our, the application we're working on right now is for about $2 million to combat opioid, uh, the opioid crisis, and we can apply in two ways. One is employment services for individuals who are addicted, and right now we're thinking about um, employment services for those who are in medically assisted treatment and looking at expanding apprenticeships. The other opportunity is for us to use a portion of the money to try to build um, the workforce that supports the opioid um, crisis. And so we're working with our partners at ADAP and Voc Rehab and others. And so I'm going to listen for even more opportunities as we're writing this grant and what your responses are. That's wonderful. And it's also there's uh, funding in the appropriations bill that is progressing, maybe, <laughs> uh, to do some more workforce recruitment, and loan repayment, looking at different opportunities, also psychiatric nursing programs. So that's exciting. But we also need to go back to the reimbursement issue. Uh, the reimbursement issues mean that, again, master's level individuals who have license in alcohol and drug counseling are making in the 30s. The pet store owner in Montpelier, she has the license, she could do the work, but when you get paid so little, people don't stick with it, or they, and, or, and some people don't go into it, and I also know of people who have picked engineering and other fields because they know why invest in an education where you're not going to be able to pay your bills when you get out or even pay off your loan. So we need to really look at our ADAP and DIVA payment rates for some use disorder services. Our hubs and spokes are wonderful, but the focus is actually on the medication administration. Again, those counselors working those programs are not making adequate reimbursement uh, salaries to really stick with it and people aren't getting the level of support they need a hub is required to give a half an hour of therapy a month when you if that's not enough uh, people need more support their lives are in chaos they need a lot of support so we need to develop this workforce but we really need to look at the funding levels and not just at developing programs and loan repayment. We need to look at how to re-support the services so people get access to quality care. Um, at, at Castleton, we do have an individual in our social work department who ha is part of the governor's task force on the opioid crisis. And one of the creative things he has done is that he has developed a, a course within his the social work curriculum for students to become certified as and there's it's an addictions apprentice, um, which. Don't ask me all the ins and outs of that, but I think that we can all sort of guess at what, what that is. And my understanding of this work is that the students are then able to go out and to work in, in communities, assisting those people who are the professionals to reach and access the individuals who are having problems. And it's just, it's that hubs and spokes, I think. Um, but I think that's just a small, minor example of things that can be done and that's being done without any funding. I think there's a lot more that, that can be done from the standpoint of education. Certainly, we could be doing a nurse practitioner program if we had the funding. So let me just say one thing. So Robin, you know, I just had a meeting today um, before I came, drove up here from Brownsville with um, HCRS, which is the Community Mental Health Agency, and uh, Chief of Police and our Town Manager in Brattleboro because of our opioid crisis, and especially as it hits the emergency department. And we've just hired, um, actually at the end of last week, a um, psychiatric nurse practitioner um, to be placed in the emergency department to help our physicians, who are not trained as psychiatrists, um, to um, assist folks with mental health, substance abuse, uh, issues, and which represents now 10 to 15 percent of all of our ED visits um, at the hospital. Um, I constantly approach Al Gobey and Melissa Bailey about funding for the position, but uh, I don't think it's going to come, so you'll hear it during the budget <laughs> process in our health care reform part of it. But um, it's placed a lot of pressure on the, on, the, um, on the hospital, but also on our medical practices, so we've embedded mental health counselors um, in some of our larger um, 
practices as well as uh, expert trained individuals. So, um, but there is no real reimbursement on that. So it's either from the state or we're looking for grant money. But, um, and I do want to, I do think um, the community health team and the blueprint um, in the hub and spoke have done a phenomenal job in our area. Um, very, very active and uh, we do have now Suboxone um, uh, treating physicians and nurse practitioner now uh, with the medical staff because one of the things the new nurse practitioner can do is start folks on Suboxone with a referral in the ER with a referral into the community community. So um, it's a great need. I'd like to echo what Julie said about um, the master's prepared counselors and the pay issues, the wage issues. We do a lot of work with undergraduate students who are thinking about what's next for them and their pursuit of graduate level training. And I hear over and over again folks who are interested in social work or counseling type positions, but when they realize the amount of training that's necessary, the increasing their educational debt for that training, and then the wages that on the other side, they, they find something else to do. So we're losing them in that pipeline because of that future earnings issue. I would pass, but I would say that um, it's not, at the Montag, it's not an area of our expertise. And so we stick, to, stick close to our knitting and try to do what we do well, well. Um, if there are areas that need to be developed, we're happy to take a look at them, keeping in mind it takes two to three years to develop a program, and then you have those years thereafter before you have your graduates. No, that's okay. okay. The, um, so, two things to consider that I've seen in our own family medicine department is it's become a bit of a, it's an unwritten standard, I guess I would say, for recruiting that we ask our candidates, are you willing to prescribe Suboxone in our family? And, um, you know, I don't do as much recruiting as I used to, but I can't, I can't think of anybody that I've met in an interview that said no. Um, so whether that's just the new culture, people are being trained in that environment, we're setting the expectation, that's gone well. The other thing that I've noticed, because um, it's nice to work, focus on some things that are working well, um, is that the hub and spoke model has provided for some family physicians, and I could think of two off the top of my head, and there may be more, um, uh, a specialty, if, if you've been a, a primary care provider and a good one, but are maybe burning out on the breath and really need to focus a little bit. I've seen people uh, have some second careers working in the hub and retrain themselves and reinvent themselves. And it's been both a victory for the community as well as that provider because they have a, now a place where they can really have their career flourish. So that's been lovely. Reimbursement is a problem. Just make sure everybody can hear can you guys all hear? All right. Uh, I'll just share what I consider a success story around uh, uh, Matt and treating uh, people with op opiate addiction. Um, one thing is in FQHC, we often have access to uh, federal grant opportunities that allow us to do really innovative things in our communities. And one thing I'm proud of at Northern County is we've gotten really good at leveraging those federal grants to support our mission. A couple years ago, we had an opportunity uh, to uh, apply for a grant to expand um, MAT services within our community, specifically around supporting uh, mental health, behavioral health uh, professionals within the practices. We looked at the grant and we were really struggling with um, whether or not to apply and how we would leverage those dollars because we can't find the professionals. Mm -hmm. And we kind of struck on a really, I feel like it was a really innovative um, solution that really addressed the workforce challenge because when you go through a program to become a uh, mental health uh, professional, um, to then become licensed, you need, what is it, 2,000 hours of supervision, right? Now here's the problem at the health provider. Um, when I take a master's prepared uh, mental health professional and uh, want to hire them, but they are not yet licensed, I cannot bill for them, right? So what do you do? Um, what we were able to do is craft this grant in such a way that we said, we're going to hire master's prepared, unlicensed professionals who are working towards their licensure. We will provide the supervision so that they can get licensed and they will support the expansion of our NAP program. 
Okay. So, um, so it was really innovative. We're paying these people a salary, a decent salary, um, while they're becoming licensed. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, they become licensed and can become billable professionals. To this date, in about a year and a half, we've had at least three people become licensed through that program. Um, we've hired two of them. One of them is working elsewhere in the community. And we're able to continue to, uh, to replicate that uh, through those grant dollars. So we're helping people with opioid addiction. We've been able to expand our MAP program. We now have nurse practitioners who are, uh, who are providing uh, Suboxone uh, support. Um, and we're building our workforce in our community. Thank you, Sean. Tom. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I'm relatively new here. Um, I won't be able to say that too much longer, but I, I'll use it as much as I can for a while. Um, and, but I'm spending quite a bit of time on the road and getting to know folks out in the field. Um, uh, Sean was nice enough to show me around uh, his turf a while back, and uh, pretty soon I'll be, um, after our budget season is over, I'll be heading south. Um, but one of the things that everywhere I went, I hear about um, this recruitment issue. Um, and when you kind of begin to look at uh, hospital budgets, you see um, the travelers' budgets are going up and up and up. And so when I discuss that with people, what I find is that it's almost a two-to-one ratio in terms of the expense to get a traveler versus having somebody on staff. Um, and that, to me, is an immense um, differential. And so I'm wondering, um, as you folks and we develop uh, strategies, recruitment strategies, which I'm sure being good Vermonters, we will figure this out um, over time, um, that whether or not, uh, that if these solutions are system-wide, whether or not there is uh, a reasonable basis to put together a system-wide funding system based on the savings of travelers to some extent, where the institution that um, is paying the traveler uh, saves money and gets a staff, and as we uh, get more successful, um, um, money could be used system-wide rather than staying in the separate silos. Um, so that's just a thought, um, because uh, I went back and I looked at uh, the statewide hospital budgets. And they, uh, for 2017, had budgeted uh, about 170 travelers, but they actually hired 231. And so when you take 231 and multiply it by the average salaries of those travelers, you're talking tens of millions of dollars um, uh, that is uh, uh, being spent twice, essentially. And the second thing I would ask is that I did hear from time to time you know, that um, at the hospitals that um, the, the issue of incentives in terms of recruitment was sometimes a difficult problem to deal with with the existing staff. Um, uh, there's a situation where, you know, I didn't get this benefit and uh, uh, these new people are getting this benefit and I'm just wondering if uh, you folks have run across that problem in your travels. So I used to be the nurse manager of a, of a birthing center, and we had a sudden explosion in, in our census um, because of closures, <laughs> being in a rural place, uh, loss of obstetricians, gynecologists, uh, you know, shuttering up because they were aging out. And uh, so we were faced with having to hire some travelers. And I'll, let me just tell you a little bit about th this whole situation. So just as you mentioned, they're getting paid top dollar. They're coming into your organizations. Uh, some of them can be very talented, very wonderful, very altruistic in some respects. But quite honestly, I, th I think that we need to take a look at people who are doing this traveling as mercenaries. <laughs> Um, they are guns for hire, um, and from my own personal perspective and from talking to many of my colleagues who serve as managers of units that are faced with having to hire travelers, um, they're a social contagion and they're a cultural toxin. <laughs> they come into organizations and they say to them, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you're doing this this way. Really? You guys, you guys have what benefits? What are you getting paid an hour? Oh my gosh, well you should become a traveler. 
I think we have to stem the, the tide. As somebody who is, is an educator, I think it starts with education. I think it starts with helping people to understand that part of the role of being a professional is professional engagement. And that means being engaged in the politics of your organization to shape that organization in such a way that is a very healthy workplace for all employees and that you deliver the highest quality and the safest care. So I think it starts with education. I think that uh, much like my colleague Liz had, had mentioned before, when we think about solutions, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to end up being a race to the bottom. Um, that we'll, we'll create something, we'll say, let's take these monies that are being spent on travelers and let's give the nurses better benefits and da 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 da, and then the traveling nurse organizations will just. <laughs> we'll just up the ante. So I think, you know, we can do these things in the short term. Um, we can create some of those kinds of solutions that you're talking about. But I think, really, it behooves all of us as professionals to be educating the current and the next generations of, of nursing about what it really means to be a professional and how important it is for you as a professional to be engaged as a professional in the organizations that you work in and engaged in your communities. Thanks. A little bit of my soapbox. <laughs> so I'll take a little different tact. Um, where are the travelers? And the travelers are in specialty care areas. Critical care in our hospital is critical care, and it's the emergency department. Um, I think what we need to do is have training programs with the higher education institutions to take the med surge nurses who are interested in exploring critical care opportunities and create both a clinical pathway and an educational pathway. And that's a challenge I'll give to the educators here, um, because that burden is now placed solely on the hospital. And the reason why we have the travelers is because we're not getting those nurses trained in those specialties um, right out of the gate. Um, the other piece is, Tom, you're right on. When I came to do our budget review, we have a, a million dollars variance uh, in our budget for travelers, 11 FTEs of travelers. Um, right before us was Rutland, and I think, Kevin, they were at over 30. 41. 41, thank you. I mean, huge dollars. But um, it's not only about money. It's really not about money. It's about training. It's about education. Um, it's about the interest of the nurses to go beyond that med surge. We don't have a problem recruiting med surge nurses at all. Where it is in the, is those specialty areas because a lot of those specialty areas are nurses that have trained in those areas, and what we're doing now is trying to recruit OR nurses or, or specialty care nurses out of Keene, out of Greenfield, um, out, out of Southwestern. Um, that's not good enough because we're all feeling that pain right now. So we've got to do something different, and that's going to have to take partnerships with the educational institutions to come up with a training program for OR nurses. We were sending um, med surge nurses up to Dartmouth because they had to have a training program specifically to take a med surge nurse and give them educa the educational piece uh, from an OR or for an ER, and then they come back to our hospital for their clinicals. We've got to do more of that in Vermont. And that's a challenge I give to um, the educational institutions here. You all? So where I had been before, we had we actually had um, uh, started down the road of developing an OR training program. So there is uh, a woman who came out of Massachusetts, she basically, she has a curriculum, you, ba you, you, you just need to purchase it. 
she's got the curriculum that, that is sort of ready. But the problem is adding, adding more time sometimes on to people's educational trajectory. Um, so it could be sort of a post-certification post program. And um, the baccalaureate program that I ran for 10 years, we had a, a really robust critical care very robust. Our problem right now with being able to have something that even comes close to matching that is having the clinical clinical site. You know, I have people who have critical care backgrounds, but it, it's really sort of having the, the clinical sites and being able to have the exposure. So we have started a critical care course in our baccalaureate curriculum. The students take it right before they leave for um, their senior capstone, and um, they uh, go through all sorts of different uh, simulations and scenarios, looking at some of the more common high-risk kinds of things. But it's just the beginning of what you could actually do if you, if you, you know, it all comes back down to resources. And for us, it's really sort of the, the clinical resources to be able to do it well. I'll try to be a little ray of sunshine here. So I, I'm having sort of an aha moment, and I don't. I think this might be just reconstructing what we think of in our current program. So what I just heard is an employer and an education provider who are describing a situation that sounds very much like a registered apprenticeship. And while we typically think of registered apprenticeships as electricians and such, the federal government has, because Trump loves apprenticeships, um, put more money into providing funds for states to expand the apprenticeship opportunities Opportunities, and we've been um, offered some guidance in looking at Europe and other models and how they are developing apprenticeships at the higher sort of white collar professional level. And so it might be worth having a conversation after to see if we may be able to structure an apprenticeship at that level where the higher education provider can do related instruction, which there's funding for, on the job training, which sounds like it would be the clinical component. And you have the employer who sort of uh, helping to pay while you, um, you know, learn and earn at the same time. So there could be some opportunities there for some um, innovative or novel approaches to solving this problem. But well, we started a, a program, you know, uh, exactly, exactly and, what we talked about. And, and, and we have a million dollars uh, So several years ago, we, we had a major problem recruiting MAs, which are critical for the physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs to act at, um, you know, to, to um, practice at the top of their license. If you don't have the MAs, who's going to uh, run those patients? Who's going to take the vital signs? So we had a, a horrible situation uh, where we had physicians um, uh, doing that, and that really reduces their productivity. So I went to Joyce Judy from um, uh, CC and I said, we've got a real problem here. Can we have a, a um, accelerated program um, where we actually provide scholarships, eight, uh, eight students, I think it's around 4,000, 4,500 apiece. Um, at that program, we do, you all do the uh, a semester of the academic piece. We do the training in our medical groups, in our practices, and we guarantee eight of those students who we give scholarships a job um, when they graduate whether there's a position or not, but there always are going to be these positions. And what's beautiful about this program, and we're in its third year now, is we have diet techs, you know, the folks that are working behind the tray lines, serving the foods, dishwashers, now progressing into this MA program, and now they're going to VTC for their LPN and are, or going on to their RN. So we're starting that workforce development. But it takes kind of an innovative, one innovative, um, educational partner to work with, and um, CCV has been that piece. Um, and I think, as I keep mentioning, we've got to get the educational institutions and the businesses, and i.e. the hospitals together, to identify these needs and come up with solutions. Whether another another problem we have is is um, RNs, who are associate degree RNs, getting them to get a BSN. Right now, we're sending two nurses out of Vermont because the cost is cheaper at Elms in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. That's crazy. So we gotta look at those kinds of things to keep folks in Vermont. Less expensive, we, we're, we're sponsoring- Cheaper than Castleton, cheaper than who? VTC. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, so we just started fully online. It's both, and Elms is both online. But those are the kind of things that we've got to get our act together up here. So we keep the, um, they keep the students in Vermont, and we're not sending, and I'm not sending dollars out of Vermont for the educational piece. But I've got to have partners to work with, like what we've had with uh, CCV. Thanks. I just so I I wanted to. This is a very interesting conversation to to take it a, to respond a little bit more directly. I, and I heard you musing about how we could um, create an incentive for cost savings around travelers, which I really appreciate. Though I, I would. The one thought I'm having is that we, we have a large incentive already not to use travelers wherever we can. So I, I think that, you know, we use them during big volume surges when we have to, when we really need, I mean, the care has to be provided, right? That has to be done. Um, but we have every incentive and we want to fill those spots with people who are going to be around, invest in the organization and the community. So just, just so you're aware of that, that nobody's, nobody's looking to have more travelers than expected. Yeah. No, my, my question was geared to having fewer of them. Fewer of them. Uh, sure. Uh, but first, I want to say I think this has been really inform informative, and I think the whole group has really articulated, you know, the problems that that you face. Um, and I really want to direct a question to um, Dustin and Sarah because um, it's not unique to this industry, you know, as we've said. And and you know, right or wrong, Vermont is not known to be a business-friendly state. And the whole thing with trailing spouse that goes against, you know, that goes throughout, you know everything, um, you know, corporate as well as the medical side. So I'm just wondering, um, and I don't know if you guys did this program, but there's been a lot of headlines lately about this $10,000 people can get for, you know, working, you know, working remotely in the state and, you know, people joke that you have to buy clothes will cost you that $10,000 and what qualifies. But my point was going to be, you know, how do you decide where to put that type of funding and, you know, why not at something like a medical profession and I understand 10,000 isn't necessarily a ton of money but you know this problem isn't going to get corrected just by getting more people into jobs in the medical profession because it's it's really a statewide issue across all the industries um, you know that just wondered how you guys prioritize what programs can be done so when we Hey, I don't think that came directly from this, but it was a collaboration with the Agency of Commerce. Uh, and but it was actually the Senators. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Senator Sorokin and Kevin Cole Committee decided where that money was going to go. And honestly, I think we, we supported it just because um, we were looking for ways to, to get people. I think a lot of the conversation that I've heard today is, is fascinating because, like I said before, if you go to Global Foundries, they did the same exact thing. If you go to Milan and St. Albans, they did the same exact thing. Um, and it really is straight up subtraction, right? We have 16 fewer, 16,000 fewer people in the workforce than we did. A lot of that, if not a majority of that, is based on retirement. So as these positions leave, it's not that we're not retaining people. As if they're leaving Vermont, that we're not retaining them within the workforce. And Sarah uh, came up with a really, I don't know that she came up with it, but has pushed a really great idea called an internship where we're investing state money uh, and folks to get back into the, into the labor force. That might be, um, you know, a nurse who spent her, her entire or his entire career in um, emergency room and now wants to do two or three days at home health. Might not be the best fit, but we're trying to figure out ways to get people and those skills to stay in the workforce, whether it's a nurse or an engineer. Um, and, and I think we recognize, I think everybody recognizes the cost of living in Vermont. I think what's going on Right now, the legislature and administration is, is, is kind of bringing that whole thing to a head. Uh, but we tried to do as much as we could uh, in our original plan, and a lot of it got left on the cutting room floor uh, without spending more money. And what I hear from from this group is that there there does need to be more investment from somewhere into quality employees. And I guess my question to the group at some point would be, what's the most prioritized money that can go there? I mean, is it the Medicaid reimbursement for places like Franklin County where the mix is super high? Um, but where can we put the most strategic money to make the most difference? And 
you know, we need to retain people that come here for college. We have incentives for people that come to UVM and go through their system or come to the state colleges and go through their system so that they actually stay here. And we have to figure out ways to train the half of Vermonters that graduate from high school that don't go on to any post-secondary mm -hmm. education at all. You know, my sister's now in Allen and Albans works for care partners. She would love to become an RI, but she can't afford it. How do we help that person who's already in the field create that career pathway so it's not just your job, but it's your, your entry and your, and your fast lane to the career that you can aim, grow, and be provided with um, you know, a lifestyle that I think those folks deserve because those, they have the worst jobs. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, honestly, they have mm -hmm. the toughest jobs. Mm -hmm. So, Sarah, um, while you're thinking about uh, your response. Also, if you could interject into this question, you talked about 98% of your funding is from the federal government. You talked about the opportunities that are there. Um, so as part of your answer, if you could include whether or not you think there's money being left on the table because we're not getting um, hospitals or education institutions to step forward to access those funds? And if so, who should Steve and his colleagues yeah. be talking to to make sure that we're not leaving money on the table? Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, well, so I'll speak, I'll speak about one aspect of the recruitment, and that's not just the recruitment, it's the relocation. And if there's something that I know I've learned in the last year or so of trying to tackle this, um, this problem is that um, there is a strategy to getting, to identifying uh, a candidate to move to the state in any profession. And then there's, um, there are all the things that need to happen in order for that to actually happen. You know, for, for that, whether it's housing or it's the, the right pay or it's um, the talented partner, which is a new trailing spouse, um, the talented partner supports. Um, all of those pieces make a difference. And, um, for many people who have successfully come back to the state, I myself grew up here, I left for four years, I came back. A lot of what brings people back to the state is a connection through family or through some other institutional social connection, and I think that's a no-brainer for, for many of us. For those who maybe came here for school and don't have a connection other than their school to come back, they do need a little bit of that relocation support. So one of the ways that we are looking at money that is currently on the table is this uh, amount of money we have about $2 million to provide employment services through wagner Pizer funding. And so some of those career services that we can, be, we can and are providing to employers and job seekers right now, um, we are looking to de dedicate a relocation unit within the Department of Labor to specialize in some headhunting strategies and some career placements, not just for those who are un unemployed, which is typically some of the, the folks that we're working with right now, but the higher um, skill level individuals who we could be, who other groups like by state and others are recruiting, and then we can, the state can help provide some of that relocation services and being the, the, um, the conversion funnel. Um, the money that I, I have to say, we aren't leaving any money on the table, but I think we're leaving opportunities untapped. Um, the, uh, the, the one I've already spoken of um, is apprenticeship money. The federal government, it doesn't seem to be expanding any of our other pools of money for training um, and investment, but they are continuing to fund apprenticeship uh, money. I know that New Jersey has developed two apprenticeships related to substance abuse and mental health counselors, and I, and I have one of my coworkers looking into what that model looks like to see if we might be able to, to um, go to our friends um, here at the table for both the related instruction and also the support of those employers. Because just as a reminder, apprenticeships take an employer commitment and um, the instruction. So some of the opportunities for funding are in things like apprenticeship um, funding. The other area that we, I think, are trying to retool is um, we have a pot of funds that is for uh, youth services, particularly out of school youth. And for those who may not be familiar, youth um, uh, are up to age 25. And if we can, um, rededicate the way we're serving students who graduated from high school but aren't continuing on in any post-secondary way and we can bring them into our caseworkers start working with them on a plan we can we can provide funding for training at uh, tech centers at uh, C 
CCV. I know CCV and um, Lyndon and Johnson have also per, uh, participated as uh, training providers for some of those educational and training services for students. So I think um, looking at certificate programs with our, our um, education partners is, is something that we have a lot of opportunity to engage on, or engage in, and ensuring that those certificate programs are being provided where the people are. So Northern Vermont um, University, right, NBU, um, has some great, I, I've learned they've got some great certificate programs right now in hospitality. Um, the problem is a lot of the hospitality need is in Rutland and in Chittenden County. And so trying to work with some of your staff to figure out, and I know there's, there's um, uh, steps being taken already, but trying to make sure that where we're providing those certificate programs and those uh, learning opportunities, that they're, that they're available to the employers and to the um, individuals where they are. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a few other grants that, are, that we're looking at right now in terms of, um, that might be of interest to this group. Uh, had a meeting this morning about workers' compensation and how some training of some docs, um, if we could pull down another source of funding, could help people return to work faster. Mm -hmm. If they could um, begin to do some earlier interventions with the, with the individuals that they're treating. Um, and so we're looking to see what the state of Washington is doing currently in terms of workers' comp and their return to work rates. There seems to be some medical evidence that um, some types of medical strategies um, are very successful. So uh, though if any of what I said it interests any of you, um, I'm happy to talk. And I, I'll make one final remark about areas of um, alignment. And that's in terms of longitudinal data collection. The Department of Labor, while very protective of this data, does maintain the wage, um, wage and hour division. So we already do report on anyone we've served um, or Vogue Rehab has served or Agency of Education has served um, and we're going to have to be reporting more on where those folks are um, two, four, six years down the, down the road. As ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, comes into place and the Agency of Education is having to report on people who are 16 months out of high school, we're going to have to start tracking where they are and who they're, if they're employed, if they're in a training program. So we are at the state level trying to make sure that our data systems are aligned and I could see some opportunities there for us to model and pilot some of these programs to see what works and to create some of the evidentiary trail that might lead to further funding and further development of best practices. Dustin. Really quickly, two seconds. I think also, you know, keep, as we keep in mind, we're having this conversation at a time in Vermont's history where we literally have a diminishing number of Vermonters. So a diminishing number of people who are actually paying into the system mm -hmm. while costs are going up. One of the things that I think Kevin uh, did a really good job of when we served in the Senate together was pushing the question, Sarah too, but she was in the House, so I don't really count that. Um, how we pay for higher education in the state of Vermont, right? So we are dead last in funding for our state universities, our, our state university, we have three, three now with UVM. Um, and while I know it is physically impossible for us to cut a billion dollar check, which I would love to do to make sure every Vermonter can go to college, how we provide training might be a way for state colleges and UVM to get more money um, out of uh, kind of out of the system, so that we're providing that bridge from high school to a two-year degree or a four-year degree. I think if we don't have the conversation about how we fund higher education and training, and I think really important is the and training. And I think the state college system and UVM are the obvious place to push for monitors. Um, then we're going to be here 10 years from now talking about why we have 50 percent of our not going out of college, why we have workforce problems. It's really, we have to build that bridge, and if we can't, we're going to be struggling. And, and back it up to the technical and vocational centers Absolutely. Mm -hmm. in the public school system. Yep. 
Well, thank you. I think that, uh, uh, Dustin, I did want to point out that oftentimes I felt like I had more success working with Sarah than I did with some of my colleagues in the Senate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> How many counties did we pass together? <laughs> well, it's funny. So 919 was our workforce bill, and I was sitting in the Senate this year when it passed. I'm thinking to myself, I finally got a bill passed in the legislature, and I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we do always open up um, anything that we do here at the Green Mountain Care Board to comments and questions from the audience. But before we open it up to the audience, I wanted to give the panelists an opportunity if they would like to ask another panelist a question. Don't feel that you have to, but I just, you know, sometimes you're sitting at one of those tables and you wish you had the opportunity to ask a question. So if someone would like that opportunity, now is the time. Go ahead, Liz. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> well, <laughs> fire away, Liz. So I'm concerned at the lack of um, attention that oral health and dental health gets in these conversations about primary health care and that it's so segmented. Um, the, the health department recently released its report on the 2017 dental workforce uh, relationship survey and there are some trends there that are concerning and I'm thinking about vulnerable populations and those served by Medicaid and how access continues to get more and more challenging for them to, to receive dental help. In the 2017 data 60% of the dentists um, only 60% are now accepting new Medicaid patients whereas 97% of those dentists are still accepting new non-Medicaid patients. 33% of the current dental workforce is accepting um, ages five plus, uh, or, or accepting five plus new Medicaid patients, um, whereas they're accepting 80% um, of anybody else if they, if they have their full pays or private insurance. And th those numbers, those percentages, um, if we look at the relationship survey since 2011, we're seeing a downward trend. Almost every, every survey is going down, down, down. Fewer and fewer are accepting new Medicaid. Um, and that links directly to Medicaid reimbursement. Um, so this is concerning when we look at access to health. And, and also, um, I guess my, my main plug in this is that oral health and dental health is part of primary care and part of overall health and wellness and we have to stop segmenting it. Um, earlier there was a question about innovations and, and things that we could look at differently and I think that we really need to look at school-based clinics um, for ensuring that all children are getting access to dental care. So that is an excellent question, Liz. Oh, and I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it, it really is. And uh, um, it reminds me of a conversation I had just two, two mornings ago, I think it was, with Jess. And um, we are tasked with updating the health resource allocation plan. And that's going to take us some time. Um, but we want to do it right. And one of the things that we talked about was making sure that dental was included in this next HRAP as we inventory what resources are available now and what is not available, where the shortages are. And um, we know that um, so many physical ailments are also linked to oral health issues. So we're with you on that. We also believe that vision is a stepchild. And, um, you know, especially when you look at uh, the Medicaid program, what they're willing to fund in either one of those two areas, um, it kind of sets the tone. And where that divide um, first started between certain areas of health and others, I don't know, but it's something that I'm going to continue to try to research and, and try to get into. But you have earmarked something that sometimes we get too focused on what we perceive as the traditional health care means, and we lose track of other areas that could be creating even bigger problems because who's going to get a job um, as Dustin and Sarah are trying to uh, get people in the workforce that um, has poor dental health or who can't even read the application. So um, those are things that we're always focused on. Yes. Thank you. So I, I'd like to add that our 
Honolulu's dental therapy program is part of what we believe is the solution for some of this. We, it, we're not adding dentists. A dental therapist is someone who can do the lower quartile of dental uh, procedures, freeing up the dentist to do the upper tier, more expensive procedures. And there are three other rural states, uh, states Alaska, Minnesota, and Maine, who have passed this legislation. In Minnesota, it's been discovered that this is actually an economic benefit to dental practices because it allows uh, the dentist to, um, to, to take Medicare and Medicaid patients and give those procedures to the dental therapist, freeing them up. So it's actually a, a multiple benefit. Uh, again, that's based on funding from, from state and other sources and, and won't be in, in place until 2020. We've been seeing some great things from FQHCs exp expanding the clinical practice of dentistry from Bennington, Trey. We uh, um, were very pleased to work as a board to get that C certificate of need turned over as quickly as possible so that Bennington could proceed. So, um, you know, we, we understand the issue and it's, a, it's an issue that needs a lot of work. I think one of the challenges, because um, we went to our local dentist in the community um, and said, uh, we'll, we'll pay for a dental therapist once you get your program up. But the la there's a lack of getting a collaborative agreement, which they have to practice under, which is a little different than, uh, as I understand, Minnesota. So that's a challenge. Um, but we've got a group with working with United Way that's working on But I, I bet, Kev, if you look at every, every hospital's community health needs assessment, Mental health and dental are going to be at the top. Yep. Okay, who else from the panel would like to ask a question? Nobody has to. Okay, Sarah. I just want, I'd like to know more about, um, in Castleton, you mentioned the, um, ca some money for a simulator or for a lab, and I'm just curious to know if, um, for some of the training needs that you have, if that is, um, if training tools like that, that might be mobile, could be shared among uh, various institutions, and if there's anything in the state college's rules that would preclude um, that type of arrangement. I don't know of any rules that would preclude that kind of arrangement. The machinery, the simulators are fairly delicate. Then, you know, um, you could potentially, I do know of, um, I do know of a place in which they had a mobile simulation lab. So I do, I do know of that. It's not un unheard of, but you would need to have something that was really pretty heavy duty. Like I'm thinking the kind of thing that rock stars go around in, you know, when they're on tour. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of those really sort of, you know, hefty buses that you could, yeah, that the, you the could ones, have. The ones that we've seen had some yeah. quality come up. Um, they're not the uh, $50,000 to $100,000 versions. Mm -hmm. They're way, way north of it. Um, but it is, it is an idea that actually most simulators sit unused the yeah. majority of the time. Yeah, because we're looking at, the, at some simulators for CDLs. I mean, as you know, CDLs are also a, a, in great demand in the state. And it's much cheaper to buy a simulation or a simulator lab where it can move from institution yeah. to institution. And I'm just wondering if there may be some parallels here and some opportunity to make some similar types of investments. The other thing is avatars. You know, the, you know, avatars are becoming sort of more and more prevalent. I think you're probably seeing it in medical education. Right. Um, or, you know, beginning to see that in, in nursing education uh, as well. So, you know, the problem is that the regulations have not caught up with that and don't recognize that as, you know, a comparable form of so I have to admit that you kind of lost me. Being a former movie guy, I know what the avatar is in the movie, but what are you talking about? <laughs> so um, I'm talking about, uh, so, so if anybody does gaming here, you know what an avatar is. But basically, it is a, it is a simulated person that is okay. animated, um, interactive, um, they are very, very highly programmed, very interesting. They're using them, I see, see them being used a lot in the training, the beginning training of folks in uh, assessment skills, interviewing skills, uh, therapeutic communication skills, psychiatric mental health, 
um, uh, critical care scenarios, these kinds of things. But they're they're sort of you know it's it's something that has sort of caught on in the in the last few years. But certainly, if those are developed, less expensive than having to to you know. Um, fix equipment and whatnot. But but right now, I think what anybody who has been in any kind of a, a healthcare professions training education program would tell you that the rubber meets the road when you get your hands on something. That's when a concept becomes alive to you. That's when it begins to make some real sense to you that you're seeing it sort of unfolding in front of your eyes. So I still think that there is going to be, be that need, but I think some of it will, will end up being replaced by avatars. Okay, great. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to the audience for any uh, public comments or questions. Yes, go ahead, Dale. Speak loud so the camera can get you. I really enjoyed this. It was excellent. I really just talked as far as how well you all did. I am curious about one thing in particular, though. Um, I've heard this many, but this is the one I'm going to ask. When you focus on the workforce and you focus around colleges preparing that workforce, saying that we aren't going to have as many people <laughs> from in terms of we have dwindling attendance at schools um, we're exporting more than we're importing in that whole conversation there's another conversation that kind of isn't at this table and that is the public school system the students are in those schools right now. They aren't getting advanced courses. They're being cut. They aren't getting some of these things that I would call crucial to education where if you've got a talent, the school is going to support you building and finding out what you're really good at. It's focused more on special education, getting the person up to being able to do a certain amount of something and stops right there. You've also got a whole social issue around school shootings and what is the emotional health of these students that have been exposed to that and don't think they're quite ready for college yet in terms of the main bar. What is this going to be for you in terms of what are you going to be inheriting to educate? Example, mental health as an issue. That could be substantial right out of high school. It's not already the eviction issues. There will be for other reasons. So I'm just curious how this looks going forward. Combined with the social determinants of health issues, where I read about students going to college who can't afford their meals and trying to learn. I can't imagine graduating with a debt ceiling where you need the loan to pay that before you can live anywhere. It's like, oh, you give me a loan, forgiveness? I'm living there. That's it. That, that's your choice. It's like you can enslave your education. We know we see a freedom again, the rest of your life. I know Sarah knows this one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, we, at the Department of Labor, we, have a, we are charged with administering the, the youth fund. And in 2016, the way that we were allowed to spend the money changed. And instead of spending 30% on out of school at risk youth, we now have to spend 75% of it on out of school at risk youth. And so it's caused us to approach our work differently. And what, what is allowed is for those individuals, those young people um, who have uh, perhaps trauma and have a lot of barriers to employment, 
we can use that money to provide wraparound services, counseling, transportation, food vouchers, boots, you know, uh, um, all sorts of uh, supports that um, I think, as you just noted, are barriers to employment. And so that's been a, even, I'll say, maybe this is the one time the federal government actually made some sort of smart decision <laughs> in telling us how to spend our money. But it really is, um, probably does make a lot of sense in terms of um, prioritizing how we're supporting that um, aspect of the workforce. I'll just add to that from my own perspective. Um, there are dual enrollment and early college opportunities that we try to offer high school students. And I'll give you one other example. In Linden, uh, we are partnering with Linden Institute and Independent High School to offer their seniors essentially a year of college while they're a senior in high school. Uh, so, you know, we have cohorts of 15 or 20 students who will earn in their senior year essentially a year's worth of college credit. Um, and if uh, they choose to come to Linden in this program, actually those credits are free. So we're really trying to make college affordable for those students who otherwise may not leave that area to go to college because of the cost. Um, regarding mental health, um, one of the things that we see in our retention data, you know, two common factors that I see on the Linden and Johnson campuses re regarding retention historically have been related to academics and, and finances in terms of students being able to persist. But increasingly in the last three to five years, this mental health issue is, is very real and is a challenge for campuses like ours in terms of the acute need that many of our students have. So it is a challenge that, that we are very in tune with. On the early college, um, one of the things that uh, uh, I believe it was just this Sunday that uh, Chancellor Spaulding was on, uh, you can quote me, and I was kind of, you know, he mentioned, I think he said there were only 125 students taking advantage of it, and I'm sitting there thinking, my God, when we pass this, I would have envisioned that half of the, the, the seniors in the state would have taken advantage of it because of the huge financial uh, gain that they would have. Well, why aren't more participating? Any ideas? I think it's a very, I think it's a good question. You know, I, I come from, originally from, from New York State and my own children were able to avail themselves of what they called in New York State college in the classroom. And so it was all done through distance learning, but you were in your particular school and at the same time you're taking a class in, let's say, economics from Syracuse University or intro to psych from SUNY Albany, these kinds of things. So, you know, my own children graduated from high school with 30 some odd credits underneath of their belt and did three years of college and earned a degree. Um, so I do wonder why that why that isn't so. Um, at Castleton, in the nursing program, we are opening up a, a three-year program that is aimed at um, you know those post-secondary students who are coming in with advanced standing, um, trying to talk to the guidance counselors in our area um, to get these students to engage and become involved in this program um, because some of them, I think get bored in high school, quite honestly. They're, you know, they're really smart kids. They want some more stimulation and, and whatnot, so. But I think that's a very good question to be asking. Not of us, maybe, but <laughs> somebody else. Okay. Other questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, I'm um, Sue Deppy. I'm a psychiatrist in Colchester, and I'm also representing the Psychiatric Association. I did email to the board members, um, thank you. Um, and I also appreciate that Susan told me last night that we were going to address this issue further, so I won't read my comments to you. Um, the main issues that are that our workforce has been decimated in outpatient psychiatry as well, really addressed some of the enormous stressors on um, the designated agencies. And the ER crisis is only the tip of the iceberg. 
people just cannot find care. Um, there are a few young psychiatrists in private practice. Child psychiatry was underserved even more than 30 years ago when the rest of the system started to decline, um, which means we're not investing in our future. Um, many non-psychiatry clinicians are having to manage very difficult things that they are not trained for, which I can only flip it around and think how good I'd be at managing an acute MI in my office, and it gives me the, the willies. Um, there aren't enough of us. Um, the persistently low reimbursement obviously is a huge issue, and for, I came out of medical school in 83 with $5,000 debt, The new people have 100000 more or more. Um, you can't graduate and go into private practice with that kind of debt. It just doesn't work. Um, our residents are just not seeing it as an option. Um, we were the first to be slammed with the egregious managed care stuff that started in about 1990. The Hay Report in the first decade of that managed care showed that the, the percent of total health care funding that went to psychiatry was cut by half in a decade. That's not a very productive behavior on the part of insurance companies. Um, the access was deliberately limited. And that discrimination continues in all kinds of areas, which I won't belabor. Um, managed care and prior authorization are usually or almost always a waste of time and money. And one of the things I'll bring as a suggestion in August is that we get rid of some of the prior authorization for meds that goes on in the Medicaid program. There is no reason under the sun we should have to prior authorize every year for a drug that somebody is already on. That's a complete waste of 20 or 30 minutes, depending on how much struggle you have. Sometimes a lot less. Um, so the other thing is that those quality measures, EHRs, it was alluded to about the training, we don't have in private practice, especially in solo practice, the money, the time, or the resources to do EHRs, get that data. So many of us are already taking cuts in Medicare payments, which are going to escalate those cuts over the next four years, okay? Um, that just cuts it come down further. Um, and there's plenty of evidence that a lot of physicians are not doing well with EHRs, and psychiatrists don't like them for a good reason that that physician relationship is also very important in our specialty. As the system unfolds, there has been very little outreach to us as far as sharing um, digital information. Um, the, the, the one time early on when I checked with uh, the uh, statewide with Vital, they were not able to be involved at all at that point, and I haven't heard a lot of outreach. Um, there's also a lot of skepticism about ACOs, and it's not even clear whether um, they wish to engage us and it's not, it's definitely not clear that they're saving money. I think we, we would have done well in view of the recent universal primary care mental health and substance abuse bill that failed in, the, in this last session. We supported that bill very strongly. We would have done much better to do that first and not do all this Medicare ACO stuff because we know that that would have saved a lot of money put more money into primary care, to put more money into mental health, to get those systems to work in a way that allows people to practice and see patients and not be spending all their time on computers and um, basically throwing in the towel because they're really demoralized. The, the, the two to one ratio of hours on the computer versus hours with patients for a lot of people isn't very satisfying. So, I won't go into all the things, but we could have saved a lot of money as a state if we could do the universal primary care. That is not the board's fault. I realize that. I want to, I'm going to strategize with my colleagues and see if there are some things we can work with with the board to make some of those things happen indirectly or other ways. Um, and we appreciate the fact that there will be another meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Stephanie Chalika, and I'm the director of our recruitment center at High State Primary Care, which focuses on recruitment for primary care providers, including oral health professionals, um, just touching into the field of behavioral health and substance use more recently for New Hampshire and Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and I work with many of you as partners or recruited on your behalf, and I just wanted to thank you all for the conversation 
say for all of the great ideas that you generated, there's a lot here that are opportunities that exist right now that we can partner on and take advantage of to attract new talent in Vermont and help them become embedded in our community and to stay here. So I just really want to thank you all for that conversation. I think um, as we, our focus is reaching outside of the state to bring people who either have lived or, or have a connection to Vermont back to Vermont or those that have a connection in our region to consider Vermont as um, a place for them to live and practice. This, these kinds of conversations are going to make a big difference in how we're able to attract them and then retain them. So I thank you all for your comments and I really appreciate the board taking such a long time to have this conversation. Thank you, Stephanie. Anyone else? Yes, Walter. My name is uh, Walter Carpenter, and I'm probably one of the few wage earners here. I've been a healthcare activist for Vermont Healthcare for all for many years, and a care advocate. And I'd like to start off, I think Dustin made a great comment about the universities and colleges, and asked us why it is that students graduate with several hundred thousand dollars in debt, where if they were from the they were in France or Germany or any one of these places at the SI school. Um, they graduated without college debt. That's one thing. I agree with Susan on the universal primary care problem versus the ACO. And another issue that was not covered by any member is that when you look at health care, health insurance, or you can pick a thousand industries, the wage earners are being bled to death by the people at the top who are just making gigantic salaries. And you know, I know the union is struggling in CDM and places like that for just fair, even fair contracts. Well, the CEO at UVM makes over $2 million a year in salary and bonuses. And this is something we've got to look at. And the last thing is, is I've listened to all of the panelists here talk about all these problems, and the problem boils down to essentially one. We don't have the political will. We're always, we've got a fight going on in the state house, as Dustin mentioned earlier. The problem is we don't, we look at taxes as bad things, as evil. We don't understand that they're public investments in ourselves. So if we're going to do something with colleges and universities and you know, technical and all this, we have to look at our tax system. And we worry about whether a few millionaires are pay less in taxes and the middle class will pay more and so on, rather than looking at them as what we can do with them. That's just a few short things, you know. <clears throat> colleges, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day are crazy. I can see people graduating with that all the time. And why? Thank you, Walter. Ken. I'm Ken Libertoff. Uh, I was director of the Mental Health Association for 30 years. And, uh, I have to say, I think, as you said before, I think people really did a great job providing perspectives. I happen to think Julie Tesla was the best, because I worked with her. <laughs> <laughs> um, relationships. Uh, relationships are important in Vermont. The, the issue that I, I just wanted to raise is that there are a lot of important, powerful people up here. But uh, there are even more powerful people sitting over here. And um, the Clean Health Care Board does have enormous amount of power in regulating health care. And it just, again, you know, is, is something to consider. Um, what, if anything, can the Green Mountain Care Board do in taking this conversation and making either sense of it or be prioritized one or two issues? Um, and should it? I think it should. Um, you know, just for example, at one point, a number of years ago, the Green Mountain Care Board actually, and this is my recall, it's not exact, but basically voted not to include dental as a key service. Perhaps the board wants to review that kind of inclination. It was, I think, for the most part, all different members. But it was a very poignant and hard discussion. It wasn't taken lightly, but there was actually this article of vote whether or not to include it as a key part of the health care plan in Vermont. But a number of issues have been raised today, and they're not new. 
and mm -hmm. it just occurs that perhaps the board would consider taking, you know, after discussion, what top, let's just say, is loan assistance and what that might do and what areas of health care that might be directed at. It might be helpful both for the providers and folks in the education field and to the legislature to know that Greenmount Care has one or two priorities that it's going to take a look at based on the workforce issue, which clearly is a critical issue. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. I think you uh, um, really have summed up the fact that when we're dealing with our triple aim of access, quality, and um, cost containment, workforce plays into all three of those. Mm -hmm. And without a, a quality workforce, we're never going to be successful here. So I, I think, at least speaking for myself, I believe that this is one of the most important issues that we have. So with that, I want to thank this panel. Just oh. one more. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> she's not my daughter, she's somebody else's daughter. Um, she just graduated from a three year master's program at New York in England um, with a clinical psychology with a clinical on substance abuse. She um, started one of the private hub and spoke programs and was totally burned out and not supported with her submission and so forth. So she left, she's starting her own private practice. And <laughs> People don't appreciate it. I have an apartment upstairs where she's living. I'm not charging her rent because she can't afford it. There's an impact on me that I'm not getting that income that I couldn't get. So it doesn't, it's not just the people the kids that come out with this horrendous, ridiculous debt. It trickles down and around. Um, it's just it's a, ridiculous. And she's a Vermonter who can back to Vermont. And is not getting any any benefit from doing that. And I, I really feel like those children who do come back get some kind of appreciation, recognition, or compensation. It's an extremely good point. And Dustin, I thought I read that um, the ten thousand uh, dollars for someone to come here, it was just for someone that had to prove that they could remotely work? So it's, there, there, there's a growing sector in the workforce that gets to work from home every day. I want to be one of these people someday. <laughs> no, uh, basically what, it's, it's, that's not four, I don't know if that was. Basically it's a, it's a shot at saying, hey, there's a variety of people who might work in Fort Wayne, Colorado, and or live in Fort Wayne, Colorado, and work in Dallas. And I literally never, other than a couple times a year, have to go to their work site. Um, this is, this is a, a, a tool to say, we'll give you a little money to come here and live here if you don't have to go to work every day and you can work and work and work here. Um, it has, it, I think it has its pluses. I think if, if, uh, if Sarah and I could have used that piece of money for something that we wanted to do, but that's a feature of the land. Down payment assistance is something we look at. Um, uh, moving assistance, you know, we'll, we'll, pay, we'll pay to move it from Syracuse to the wrong we want to come here. We look at a lot of them. So, um, and, 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 this is the one that's stuck. So, how, how many people are actually eligible for that? What is the so cap on the... Uh, 125,000, I yeah, think. Yeah, it's ca there's there are only a certain set appropriation. It begins 2019, um, so it's 125,000 the first year. So no one can get more than 5,000 in a, in a given year, even though you can get 10,000. So that's what, 250 people could be eligible okay. for it the first year. Um, I, I would just note that when I first met with uh, So, Sarah, I just want to correct your math. Please do. What did I say? You said 250 people? Yeah. 5,000 a year. It, it would... 5,000 a year. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I'm not so sure it is, but. <laughs> I believe that 5,000 a year in appropriation of, of that, it would only be 25 people. Tom, what is it? Can you do the simple division for us? 25. Uh, I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> so I, I believe it's 25 people. Not, so it's not, it's not extensive. But I know with, with by state we were talking about the talented partners or their trailing spouses, and in some cases you have folks who are um, you know, researchers, and they or they can do their work from Vermont, but their spouse may have a, you know, a, a job in Randolph. And so this would be one of those tools that that could support an arrangement like that. Um, so 125,000, I think, the first year. It's a little bit more the second year, and then uh, and then we'll see. If one of the things that we keep hearing about is affordability of uh, colleges, and I know that um, a mm -hmm. few years back the governor in Florida. Um, we had done an edict to whoever was running their community college system to come up with a plan for a four-year degree that only cost $10,000. I didn't follow that closely enough to see if they, they made any progress on that. It but was Rick Perry when he was governor of Texas. It was, yes. and I think they did it. And yeah. the state of Tennessee right now, you can get an associate's degree through the community college system. It's part of their, part of their, their system. Um, you know, I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that we have to compete for people in the future, and it's not just in, in healthcare and docs, and, and mm -hmm. we have to literally compete for people because that 200. If we if we attract 225 people, that might be the difference between our population growing or not growing next year. That's a that's a big deal. Our birth rate is really bad right now. So I mean, I think we're going to start seeing more of these creative solutions to getting people uh, to stay or come to Vermont. As uh, you know, as an alternative to continuing to raise taxes and fees and, and look for more from what? <laughs> I would just caution the conversations around college. To uh, I'm in the public service loan forgiveness program, which is so I have 200. I will say 240 thousand dollars in debt. Um, but because of federal programs, um, I can make payments based on my income, and after 10 years. If I make all the right payments, you know, my debt's forgiven because I'm working for the government. Um, that's also eligible for health care providers. Um, it doesn't work for everybody. It depends on your debt. But I just caution us when we have the conversation about college and debt to uh, remember that there are a lot of other programs that may, um, may be able to support um, the current issue. It may be just a matter of educating our young people about what they are, what they can uh, take advantage of, and it could be some counseling that we need to support. It might also be a really good way, I don't want to say dissuade because it's not at all what I mean, <laughs> but to have folks graduating in high school take a look at every option on the table that they have mm -hmm. before they commit to $100,000 worth of debt. My brother uh, didn't go to college, uh, has his master electrician's license, and it might as well be a license to print money. Uh, he enjoys <laughs> his life very much. He doesn't owe the state college system anything, um, and, you know, I still have student debt, and that sucks. <laughs> so there are a lot of options, and I think for a long time we push people in one direction. And I hope that we can start to have a conversation about what's the right fit for everybody, so mm -hmm. that you don't have somebody who's got debt and no degree uh, because that's what they're doing. One thing that I would just it just occurred to me, my son is graduating high school, actually Saturday, um, and he did a survey last year of his junior, then junior class about. Um, whether they plan to stay in Vermont after graduation. And it was shockingly low, the percentage of students that planned as 11th graders to stay in the state, um, even after graduation or return to the state or come and live here as adults. Um, and some of the reasons that we heard that he had shared with me is they don't think there's jobs here. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a, a perception problem of the availability of jobs. And you know, I think kids are always happy to leave the house and you know, get as far away from their parents as possible when they're 17 years old. But anyway, I think that there's something that we could be doing through the public education system to talk about the job opportunities in the state and to try and change the perceptions about you know, the wonderful aspects of living here as an adult and raising a family here. So. Okay, with that, we're going to wrap it up. And, uh
uh, again, I just want to thank this panel. I think it's uh, really been an enlightening conversation. We could keep going probably till the wee hours of the morning, um, but I do appreciate that uh, many of you have driven long distances to be here, and we want to thank you very much for sharing your time and your expertise and knowledge with us. So um, the board could give the panel a round of applause. So with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. It's been moved and seconded.